if it's important for you to be healthy long term, to live longer and to be confident in yourself, then you need to make a choice. Unfortunately, a lot of people are not making the choice and they're letting other people make the choice for them. Just ask yourself, what life are you living? Are you living your own life on your own terms or are you following someone else's terms without even knowing it? Just think about that. And I think if you think about it, realize you have the power to make the change that you want and you can choose which people you are around. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today I sit down with Fritz Horseman, a popular fitness coach who focuses on helping people optimize their plant-based diet and exercise to lose weight, grow stronger, and transform their health. What I like about Fritz is his focus on the practical side of things, which is exactly what this conversation is centered on. How much protein do we need? What foods should we consume to hit our protein target? Is counting calories beneficial? Can we eat intuitively? What nutrients should we supplement? How do we set up and progress our exercise? How to get back on track if you have a few days where things don't go to plan? Is protein powder healthy? Are juices a good addition to your diet? What should we do to curb cravings? Should we eat low fat and plenty more? As always, if you wanna watch this, you can do so on YouTube where full length videos of each episode of The Proof can be found. Please do enjoy. This is me and Fritz Horseman. Fritz, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, I've been looking forward to doing this for, we've been chatting about doing this for a while. Yeah, it's been, I think if I remember, you were on the podcast, on my podcast, like I think it must have been two years ago. Mm-hmm. And I think we've been going back and forth since then, like sending each other stuff mm-hmm. and just keeping ourselves up to date. And I've been looking what you're doing. It's just incredible, like all the content you put out. I think I don't know anyone else in the plant-based space specifically. Obviously, you don't only do plant-based content. I don't know anybody who does that in such detail and such consistency as you. So thanks. Amazing man. work. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, th- I was thinking sort of in in the lead up, and I have some notes here. I just, just mentioned to you, I'll probably ab- abandon those. I think, um, you know, in the short space of time where we've had a chance to have conversations and yesterday we caught each other at the gym, I feel like, well, the, the the natural way that this conversation will just evolve um, will occur without having to sort of step through notes, unlike some of my other episodes where I tend to have to do a lot of research. But I think that's because we have a lot in common and um, I probably spend a little more time on digging really deep into the science and less on the practical side of things and you're, you're probably – a little bit of the opposite of that you still look at the science and appreciate it but you spend a lot of time on the practical side of how do you implement changes to diet and exercise and so i think we kind of complement each other really well and you sort of bring this unique angle to the show Mm -hmm. um something different something that i think will be really beneficial to the listeners who have heard a whole lot of information and are you know, wanting to implement things and no doubt coming up against the the very common challenges um, that I'm sure you're super familiar with. Yes, very familiar. And I totally agree. I dove into the science like years ago and really went deep into all the nutrition science, exercise science. And then over the past few years of doing it and practicing it with me and with clients, I've realized that there's absolutely value to that, but then also for the normal person, um, they just wants to make it fit into their life. So maybe they have family and they have things going on. Then sometimes it's it's important for them to have that practical approach from from the science. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You said you, you mentioned your bicep before, <laughs> and it reminded me of how Arnold Schwarzenegger says bicep. Mm. Your accent. Tell us tell us a little bit about where you grew up and and what that accent is. Yes, it's good to to be in the same category as him. So I'm German. If you can't tell from the accent, I grew up in Germany and it's interesting because very quickly after school, like starting college, I was 
realizing that German content, like not just fitness and health content, but in general, like news and everything you can see online, wasn't really speaking to me anymore. I always felt that the English speaking content and countries like US, UK are far more advanced. So I started consuming English content very early in life and been immersing myself in that culture and been lucky to just keep on practicing and keep learning it. So even though I'm German, my English has been able to evolve a lot over the past mm -hmm. few years. And yeah, now I actually moved out of Germany into Switzerland, which is very close to Germany. Yeah. Um, Where in Zurich or? Yes, near to Zurich, Lucerne. It's yeah. called. It's a beautiful, beautiful city, like mountains and lake, everything you need to live a healthy, mm -hmm. healthy life and to focus. So yeah, I moved out of Germany, but very grateful too. Yeah, I spent a bit of time in, in Switzerland a few years back. Nice. And yeah, it's it's beautiful. Um, very clean place, very high quality of living. Very clean, like the people are super kind. You have nature all around, so you always have this this humbleness, right? Because you see the, the big mountains mm -hmm. and the lake. It's awesome. And what's the, the, the sort of health and wellness culture like there? It's, I would say a very healthy place to live because of the nature. So people go hike on the weekends. It's just like, hey, let's let's go hike for like a day hike or a weekend hike. We don't do that in a big city like Berlin, for example, or uh, bigger bigger cities. So people are super in shape, super healthy. The plant-based movement there or like the plant-based options are consistently growing and they're very right. good at and expect that. So yeah, I mean, it's not like a fitness place. People don't really aren't bodybuilding there necessarily, like maybe in LA or in other places, but like the health, the nature, the hiking, that's really prominent right. there. Yeah, I remember swimming in the lake there in summer. Is, oh, that, yeah. is that a tourist thing or? <laughs> that's <laughs> probably a tourist thing, yeah. But um, yeah, I see locals always going out and doing stand-up paddling, like just right. before going to work, like yeah, because yeah, they yeah. had the lake right in front of them. It's beautiful. Yeah, this was this was in, in Zurich, but it was it was like a heat wave for Zurich. So that was that was our way of cooling off. And I remember eating at a place called Tibbets. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Tibbets is the it's like a brunch, like all you can eat vegan brunch. Mm. And like not just brunch, you can eat there all day. And it's they have so many options. And it's also a brand that everybody knows, everybody mm -hmm. eats there. And it's not like this weird thing that just vegans go to. It's like right. everybody goes to because it's fresh food, good quality, mm -hmm. and a lot of options. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely thought the quality of, of the food in Switzerland was it was top notch. It is, yeah. Um, speaking of food, we're in Bali at the moment. Um, of all places, this is where we've crossed paths. And you've been coming here quite a bit recently. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it more of a recent thing or had you been here in previous years as well? It's more of a recent thing. So I was here like actually six years ago when I first went plant-based. Okay. That's when my plant-based story started. And then I didn't go here for like the last six years for whatever reason. I don't know why. But now this year I rediscovered it for myself. And I've been here for I think eight weeks overall. Mm -hmm. Had to fly back for some things. But yeah, it's just, just a good place for, for a healthy lifestyle and being productive and getting stuff done. Yeah. What... um. What are what are your favorite restaurants here? So far, like I'm vegan, babe. Yeah. This is a good one. Um, I, I kind of like... wish that they had a different name. Yeah, <laughs> and I say that because the food's fantastic. But when I sort of suggest it to friends that are not plant based, they get a bit freaked out by the name. Yeah, unfortunately, that's what happens. I had a conversation yesterday on a coaching call um, with my clients and. One of them shared that they have like they have kids and when they tell them, Hey, this is they when they put food in front of them and then the kids start asking them, Hey, is this vegan? Mm. And then they say yes, then they won't eat it. Um so it's like interesting to see what happens when the word is, is involved, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I can totally see how that could have a negative impact, uh, which is unfortunate. But But yeah, good good restaurant. Yeah, good restaurant. Emotion is mm -hmm. also amazing. It has a lot of like protein based mm. options, like I had protein the waffles. Pancakes. Yeah, I had, nice. I had, no, the waffles. I had the waffles today. So good. They're a weekend thing for me. Amazing. Yeah, the waffles. And also, mostly, I went to it yesterday. Uh, you recommended it to me mostly. This oh, new yeah. vegan yeah. place. What did you get? I got the. Um, what did I get? Like the like a salad bowl, like the, the grains mm. bowl they have. Like pretty simple. Um, and the sushi. Also looked amazing. Didn't go for it, but like it sounded amazing yeah. with the tofu and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like acai bowls? Um, yes and no. <laughs> We're getting juicy questions right away. I like it. <laughs> so 
I think ACE bolts in general like are a healthy option for general population. Mm -hmm. For me, being plant based, trying to build muscle, mm -hmm. trying to maybe stay lean, ACE bolts are only an option if there's protein powder involved. Right, which and there is in most of these, the ones here, not all, or yeah. at least you can ask for it. Yeah, then it's a good option. I think it's it's a good option to have um, if they don't put too much mm -hmm. granola or like coconut flakes on top. Um, if they have protein powder in it, then mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for it. But actually most of them, maybe in Switzerland or other parts of the world, they don't have protein powder, right. um, which is unfortunate, but then I don't really go for it because mm -hmm. then it's basically just carbs and fats and then mm -hmm. it's not what I'm We're going to talk about protein because I know you, you like to <laughs> ruffle a few feathers yes. online. Not always, but every now and then Fritz comes through with a, a reel <laughs> yes. for the algorithm. And there's one I want to talk to you about. Absolutely. The, the, uh, the black beans or the beans will we'll, we'll perhaps come to that in a bit. But the the, the protein waffles at, at Motion, there was no beans in those. No beans in those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you can find beans, like protein bean waffles recipes online probably, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about the, the taste of that. Um, Actually, just quickly on that, I used to put tofu in my smoothies. Like I was the type of guy who was like, hey, I don't want to have mm. protein powder. It's unhealthy. So I did like put tofu in my smoothies, which I think like it's a, it's a fair option. Like right. it's it's pretty neutral in taste, mm -hmm. um, but it's just funny to think about putting putting tofu in the smoothie. So you don't do that anymore? No. What, do, what kind of protein do you put in your smoothie? Mostly rice protein mm -hmm. because I just feel like I digest it better. Uh, mm -hmm. I think pea protein is definitely a valuable option, but I don't digest it as well. It's a bit mm -hmm. heavier on me. Uh, which can be also great for if you're dieting, like it might satisfy you longer. But I mostly do rice protein right. or whatever I have available mm -hmm. because when I'm traveling, it's not always perfect. I can't always have the brand um, that I want. So I right. always switch it up. Are you trying to hit a certain target of protein like per day? Are you, I think um, you've already sort of told me some of this. Uh, offline, but do you tracking your calories? I'm sure folks look at the content you're putting out online and look at that your transformation is incredible. You often put up photos of how long ago was that? That was at the start of my vegan journey, so five, six right. years so ago. So you definitely are sort of you know proof of what someone can do. Um, and I think people would be really interested to know, well, is Fritz, is he counting every calorie that he's putting into his body and every sort of gram of carbohydrates and protein and fat? Is that what it takes to to get into his condition? What what does that kind of journey, I guess, look like for you and, and what does it look like today? Absolutely. So when I started my vegan journey, maybe I can start there. I was already pretty fit. So I was already into working out. Mm -hmm. I was eating the typical bodybuilder diet, like a lot of chicken, a lot of broccoli and like dairy products. When I made the switch to plant-based, I just, for some reason, I had a switch in my mind where I was like, everyone was telling me, yeah, you can just eat whole foods and you'll be fine. You'll hit all your nutrients and it's whole food. So it doesn't really have that many calories. It's healthy for you. So I just, I stopped tracking my food, even though before I was tracking my food. So I just started eating whole foods, all these mm -hmm. healthy meals. What were you eating when you were tracking before changing? Yeah. What were... Give us an idea as to like what lunch or dinner was looking like. Man, like it's if you if I look at it, it was pretty pretty nasty. Like I was just basically buying the cheapest chicken I could find in the store, like frozen chicken for like one dollar, whatever it might might have been, and just having that with rice, like not even veggies, just like basically trying to hit my macros. Mm -hmm. So my idea was back then, just get my protein in with like chicken and quag and like lean sources. And then I can have a Ben and Jerry's for dinner. Mm -hmm. Like basically if it fits your macros where you're hitting your macros, which will improve your body composition, but then you're not paying attention to micronutrients, right. which will help you be healthy long term. Mm -hmm. So I was like basically eating chicken so I can eat ice cream and pizza. Yeah. And I was tracking it. Mm -hmm. So I was just putting all these things in. So hitting numbers, but zero focus on diet quality. Hitting numbers, but not hitting health basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and. Sorry to interrupt, but just before you sort of go into the experience with the, the whole food plant-based, the start of your journey, uh, what was the actual inspiration? So you were obviously inspired at that stage of your life where you were doing the whole chicken and rice and was that sort of just uh, a result of the, the type 
of content that you were watching and the environment that you were in and then what triggered you to go, hmm, I might actually go down this other path here? Yes, interesting question. So I think, so I started my fitness journey because people were telling me I was very skinny. Like, hey, look skinny, put on some muscle, gain some weight. Mm. For context, I'm 190 uh, centimeters, which I think is like six feet three. And I was weighing back when I started like 70, 75 kilos. And how old were you then? Mm, yeah, like 19, 20 mm. years old. Did you have a big growth spurt like in your late teens or were you already very tall? I think I was always pretty, pretty tall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't exactly remember, but I think it was always more on the taller side. Yeah, but I think that's pretty common for, I mean, you're, you're tall, you're much taller in real life than I think many people would probably presume. That's what I get a lot. Every time I meet someone um, like that I know from online Instagram, they meet me like, hey, you're much taller in person. Right. And I never know what to answer. What do you answer to? <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, people that are 190 centimeters, you know, in their early 20s, they often have a bit of a wiry frame. It mm -hmm. takes a bit of time to kind of fill that out. That's right. That yeah, definitely took time to fill it out. So basically then I got into like the typical bodybuilding content and most of the content you see online back then especially was just like, hey, eat your chicken, eat your dairy products like to get your protein. And I was following like if it's a macros type people. Uh, who, who um, tell, tell us the kind of folks that you were following at that period. Who, who were the kind of popular people that were in the if it fits your macros kind of fitness scene then? So it was mostly German people since I consume German content. One is called Brozap, which he's still, I still follow his stuff because very science-based and he breaks it down super easy. So I like that. Um, but I think there were some other guys like Student Aesthetics, um, now called Marian, like Rob Lipset, the Alpha Lead mm -hmm. crew. I don't know if you guys know them, but they, like Christian Guzman mm -hmm. and those type of people were pretty big back then. They were like, right. they brought up this this generation of fitness people, I think. And that's what the content I consumed. And then, So you don't kind of look back and it, and and regret that period because it sounds like, and, and I know this from my experience, there's, there's still a lot of great learnings to, to come from going through that sort of process and being exposed to that type of content as well. 100%. I don't regret a minute of it, actually. I think the earlier you get exposed to nutrition knowledge that is applicable for you, the easier your life becomes and the less of a box of Pandora it is, right? Because I think for a lot of people, it's like, okay, what is actually healthy nutrition? What can I do to change my body composition, but also to be healthy long-term? So I was lucky that I got put into that early and understood, okay, this is what matters. Mm -hmm. And then I can still adjust, right? So you can always still find a way that is even healthier. Mm -hmm. So totally, totally agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you kind of reach this point where you decide to go down this other path. Yes. So then I started following some other YouTubers. Um, I can do a shout out to Misha Janjic. Mm -hmm. Some people might know him. And he was showing how he's eating plant-based while still gaining muscle. Mm -hmm. And he was eating lentils and broccoli and all that. I was like, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. Like, you don't eat any meat. How can that be possible? And then I started reading the book, How Not to Die from mm -hmm. Dr. McGregor. And then I'm a very logical person. I'm very like, if it makes sense, I will do it. Like if there's science, I'll do it. And the book obviously breaks everything down. And I was like, hey, let's let's make the switch. Let's make it happen. So for me, mm -hmm. first reason was health. Because on the one side, I knew like I was I wasn't like really struggling. I was in good shape. Things were going well. But I knew if I continue this path, like eating the cheapest chicken, all the dairy products, like this could can't be healthy. Mm -hmm. And then I also had some acne as well when I was younger. So a lot of people said, hey, when I went vegan, that went away. And that actually happened for me as well. Right. So you read How Not to Die. And then that takes you, I guess, onto the path of a probably a low-fat, whole food, vegan diet. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you were kind of doing it early on? Yes. I was doing pretty much whole foods only. Right? That's what he talks about, mm -hmm. making sure that you get just whole foods in your in your system. You have this this list of daily dozen you need to follow. So beans, and, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and a little bit of nuts and seeds. Yes. Oil free. Oil free. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went basically from zero to one hundred like over overnight. Right. And that and that was literally an overnight change for you. Almost, yeah. So I would say I was vegetarian for maybe two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um and then I made the switch to plant based pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, just went from went from that to like eating 
whole food only, no oil, mm-hmm. no salt, no and, sugar. And so my understanding is that you did that for sort of X months or years and you, you gained a considerable amount of weight. Is that yes. Fine? Yeah, I did it for, so I went plant-based and my goal was to, because I was already pretty lean, I was like, hey, I want to put on some muscle. And it shouldn't be that hard. I would just eat more, right, train harder. I already knew kind of what matters if you want to build muscle. Mm-hmm. But then what happened is in the span of four months, I still remember it vividly, like from September to like January, I gained like 30 pounds of weight, 30 pounds, so like 15 kilos. And no muscle. Not muscle, no. If you, if you know like building muscle takes time, right? right? You know that. Um, so I was just like gaining so much weight in a short period of time. I was feeling bloated. I was not feeling good, but I was eating all the healthy foods. Right? So just to clarify, you weren't doing the whole vegan pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. No hot dogs, no hamburgers, no ice cream. I was doing, I have still videos. I'm so glad that I documented it because every time I look at the videos and photos and I post it sometimes on my Instagram too, I just, I think to myself, what did I think? Like I was putting quinoa on top of that. I was doing peas and lentils and hummus on top. So a bowl could have had like 1500 calories, 100 grams fiber maybe, and then maybe 40 grams of protein. And were you snacking a lot between meals as well? Not really. Like I was really trying to do it right. I was trying to not snack, only have whole foods and really like follow everything I saw online, like all the advice I saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So I, wa- I want to talk, I want to get to everything you're doing with coaching and whether that's like a similar experience that other people that you've worked with have, have gone through as well. Um, but, but more on you here for a moment. So at what point were you like, okay, something has to kind of change here. I need a new approach. Was it just a gradual thing or was there a sort of tipping point? Yes. So you were asking like how long this was going on, like at least six to 12 months. I don't remember exactly, but I was doing this and struggling for at least up Mm. to a year. And then I had a moment with my ex-girlfriend, actually. We were in a city trip in Italy and I was in a changing room, in a locker room and putting on, like trying on t-shirts. And she looked at me and she was like, Fritzi, you've gained weight. Mm. And looked at myself in the mirror and sometimes, you know, locker rooms are not that um, (laughs) forgiving with the light. But yeah. I was like, what happened? Because in my mind, I was still this fit person because I've done it and I have achieved it. And I realized like, something has to change. This is not me anymore. I was not feeling like I was feeling bloated. I was feeling sluggish. I was like not feeling confident anymore. I was always a confident guy, but then I was feeling self-conscious in my body. Mm. And just realized I wasn't really portraying the values, right? I wanted to show people that plant-based is a healthy lifestyle, but I was not showing it. like. Mm. A big thing I like to say to my clients as well is show, don't tell. So mm-hmm. nowadays everybody can tell stories and tell facts and all these things. Like information is cheap. Right. What really matters is actions and actually showing the result. And I wasn't doing that. I was like, well, I feel like a hypocrite. Yeah, I agree. I think I think one of the best ways you can inspire people to change is to lead by example. You know, particularly if you're trying to inspire change in friends or family. They're often the hardest people. Yes. To kind of communicate with about topics like your diet. That's what I see. That's what I see with, with the, the people we coach as well. It's like people come in and they say, people are asking, why do I look so skinny? Or why do I, aren't you supposed to be healthy? You've gained weight. Or mm. why, is your, why is your hair falling out? Like all these things obviously are not a great way to portray the lifestyle. Right. So, so were your family at, at any stage of this, like what, what were their thoughts about you changing your diet? And um, I know you, you said your girlfriend at the time, she, she made that comment, that's tough, that's tough to hear. So you were lacking confidence. Were your family also in any way kind of worried about this trajectory and changes you were making or were they really supportive of what you were doing? The interesting thing is that they were vegan before me. Right. So my sister went vegan like, I don't know, 20 years ago, like when it, when it wasn't cool. <laughs> she had to search for tofu. Like now you can find it pretty much everywhere. She, she didn't have it mm-hmm. available. So she went vegan first. And funny story there. I know it's not, it's not really funny, but I pulled a prank on her and like smuggled some, some cheese into her food back then when I was younger. Um, 
And then it's that funny is now. pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> now uh, full circle. And then my parents turn plant based. Don't do that, anyone who's listening. That's, don't do that to your sister. Definitely, definitely not. Um, and then my, my parents turned plant based, and I was the last one to make the change. So they were already pretty supportive, mm -hmm. and they knew that it's it's healthy and it's a good choice to make. Um, so I'm I'm right. blessed with that. Okay. All right. So uh, you're at that point, lacking confidence. You decide, all right, I'm I'm going to make some changes here. I'm not leading by example. I want to be a good example and inspire people to make these changes too and, and show people that you can be really healthy eating a plant-based diet. You can be fit and strong. Was it coming across some – so it was Misha, I think you said. So you came across Misha and then what changes did you make? And like from a nutrition point of view or training point of view that took you from that point in Italy where you – sounds like you were at quite a, a low – in, in your overall journey um, to then sort of getting things back on track. Yes. There's still a picture, by the way, from of me eating pizza in Italy. And that's always, if I post that, it's always always super funny and crazy to see the transformation. So I realized something needed to change. So on the one side, I got a coach. So I got a non-vegan coach, actually, because back then there weren't any vegan coaches someone that was really science-based and was into bodybuilding preps and I got consulted by him. He made me a training and nutrition plan and also I asked him like, what's going on? I'm eating all these healthy foods. I'm eating everything people tell me to do but I'm still gaining weight and not feeling good. So he just told me like what I'm doing wrong. Mm. On the other side, I just dove really deep into research and I dove really deep into actual nutrition macros, micronutrients of plant-based nutrition. Because for me, it was so interesting. The content back then, and it still kind of sometimes is, is not really tailored to people trying to lose weight and gain muscle on a plant-based diet. So I was like, everyone's telling me to eat the beans and to eat the, the quinoa. And why is it not working for me? So I had to do the research myself because no one was telling me. And then I discovered like, okay, the macros actually have to be this way and you have to eat this to actually achieve them. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure you don't get too much fiber so you don't feel bloated. And then combined with the coaching, I was able to combine like the knowledge and also the, the practice mm -hmm. and the simplicity. And that then helped me drop all the weight again in a few months. So let's break that in. down for people. So where do you think, okay, I guess even we start very high level when, when you kind of say, I think we might take for granted some of, some of this language, but um, when you say macros, what do you mean? And where where do you think it, your macros were mm. before you made the change? And when you exposed yourself to more information and and uh, learned about okay, uh, what's what's a way that's better for strength and body composition? How did you change those macros? Yes. So macros, macronutrients. It's a long word. Are basically, carbs, fats, and protein, right? and also alcohol, but we might not count that in. Um, might not talk about it. And those are like the building blocks of your nutrition, right? Every food is made of these macros. For example, rice is mostly carbs. Avocado might be mostly fats. And that's like the makeup of our food. And if you want to change your body composition, be healthy, it makes sense to set up your macronutrients in a way where it suits those goals, right? Because some like carbs might give you energy and give you like free glycogen stores, which we can also explain. Um, Fats might be good for your hormones and for general health and proteins might be good for recovery and building muscle. And what I was eating, if I look at it, I didn't track back then, so that's, that was a mistake. I didn't track my food. So that was one of the reasons probably why that happened. I was eating low protein mm -hmm. for my goals. Again, my goal was to build muscle and to get leaner. Mm -hmm. So I was you, not you getting You probably enough. weigh... What do you... What do you if you don't mind me asking, <laughs> <laughs> we're friends now. Yeah. Uh, what? What do you know? What you were weighing then? I was weighing like honestly, I was weighing a hundred kilos. Okay, and it's two hundred twenty pounds. And what? What? If you were to sort of guess, how much protein were you having per day? Like one hundred twenty, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like I was not eating low protein, but I was not hitting right. the goal. So one gram per kilo, or a little bit more. Yeah. Right. And actually, funny story as well. I used to play soccer back then still. 
and in, in, a, in a team of football, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess the US dollar is uh, stronger than the euro currently, so we call it soccer now. Okay, is that <laughs> and, how it is? <laughs> um, so I went there and my trainer saw me and he was like, Fritz, have you hit the three figures? <laughs> like in kilos, the hundred kilos. And yeah, it was, that was funny. But basically, if I look at the macros I was hitting, I was probably eating 100, 120 grams of protein, fats, definitely much, much higher, like 100, 150 grams, I think at least, which is something I want to talk about as well mm -hmm. today, fat intake as a vegan. And then carbs were like out of the, like completely high, obviously, mm -hmm. because um, I was eating a lot of lentils and beans and quinoa and, mm -hmm. and uh, bread and all of that. And now, we want to ask as well what my macros are now or mm. what was the question? Yeah, I'm interested in how you change them. So yes. you were kind of saying that you realized that your macronutrients, it sounds like where you were going with that is how you structure your macronutrients is, is greatly influenced by what your goals are. And so if someone has a goal of say, you know, just reducing their risk of chronic disease or maybe they have chronic disease and they're looking to um, get on top of that chronic disease, manage it, reduce medications. They might have a, a different kind of dietary makeup than someone who's interested in, say, body composition, getting leaner, getting stronger. Um, so you kind of identified that and then you switch things up. What, did it, what does it look like now? So you just explained where it was. What are those macronutrient sort of breakdowns now of carbohydrates, fats, and protein? Yes. Good point that you're making. Totally agree that it always depends what your goal is uh, when it comes to nutrition and the macro setup. So now I'm hitting, I'm trying to get between 1.6 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And that's more on the high end. I was trying, I was, I'm trying to get 2 grams a day just to be safe, uh, which will put me currently at 180 grams protein, maybe 190. And then for fats, I like to be, depends on what my goal is. So if I'm, my goal is fat loss, then I might be a bit lower on the fats. It might be between 0.5 to 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And when I'm trying to gain muscle and gain weight, then it can be up to one gram per kilogram body weight. Mm -hmm. And then for carbs, I always say carbs then fill up the rest. Mm -hmm. So I look at macros and optimize my nutrition. I'm not trying to count every single macro and currently I don't track anymore even. I'm just trying to get my calories right and my protein. Mm -hmm. And then the rest will kind of fall into place. So I evolved to that over, over mm -hmm. the past few few years. Um, but yeah, as you can see, the protein is much higher, like almost 100 grams more, like 60, 60, 70 grams more. And just paying way more attention to it because I always say what you measure gets better. Mm -hmm. And I was not measuring before, just eating whole foods. And then I started actually paying attention to it and... Mm -hmm. It made a big difference. So when you say you don't count now, you're not counting all of the individual things uh, or you're not counting anything at all um, or are you tracking just protein? What does I'm it look not, like today? Yeah, I'm not counting at all. So I, I'm not measuring, like weighing any food mm -hmm. or putting anything in an app. I have to say that I evolved to that. It wasn't always that way. So I used to track everything. I weighed everything out. And I think it's valuable to do that because then you get a better grasp of nutrition. Like what's actually, mm. like what does rice actually have as nutrition profile or tofu and tempeh? And then over time, you are able to estimate the nutrition in most foods. So you're like, okay, this is like one block of tofu, probably 30 grams of protein if it's a firm tofu. Mm. And then now I just, I can look at meals and foods and realize, okay, I'm probably hitting that much protein and calories. So also the two numbers I have in my mind, like I want to be in that range mm -hmm. and then I can use my knowledge from the past and my, my skill to, to determine mm -hmm. what, what I'm eating. Yeah, this kind of gets to the heart of intuitive eating because mm -hmm. what you're doing now, it's very much what I do, um, and there's a big discussion about intuitive eating, right? And I'd be keen to hear from you on what you think about it, but I think it intuitive eating, it makes sense after you are at least somewhat educated about what is in your food, or at least it's a lot easier because without that knowledge, I mean, how, how good is your intuition? 
That's right. Especially nowadays, if you look at it, maybe back in the days when we had to hunt for food and everything, maybe our intuition was better. Mm. Now you walk down the street and there's like a bakery here. So you, so you smell, wow, that smells amazing. Or even there's bad news on TV, right? And that triggers like a fight or flight. And you're like, I need to eat some food now. I need mm. to curb this craving. So in the current life that we live, I think it's very hard to listen to our bodies without having the knowledge. So I totally agree that I think it's very valuable for everybody to track their food when they start their fitness journey. So it might sound tedious, but it's really just putting your food on a scale and then putting it in, in an app. And then you build the skill of understanding, okay, what does nutrition look like? And then over time, you definitely want to get away from 100%. I'm the biggest fan of mm -hmm. not tracking because I think it definitely makes you obsessive. You do it for, for too long. Right. And... But then what happens is when you start tracking your food and learn it, and then you can combine both. You can combine listening to your body because the cues that your body gives you definitely make sense. Like there's a reason why you get these cues, but then you're able to interpret those cues right. and see it in the context. Okay, probably yesterday night for dinner, I didn't have enough protein. I just had pasta. I was probably missing like a good chunk of my daily protein intake. So that's why I'm hungry in the morning. And then you can like, adjust from there. And instead of having a donut, you can be like, yeah, I can have another scoop of protein or something else. So it really, it's really awesome. Like it's really fun as well. Right. I think a lot of people unfortunately get stuck in the beginning stages. They're like, I hate this stuff. I don't want to track my food. This is miserable. But then they don't see the vision, like mm. what's possible for them. And what's possible is intuitive eating, eating whatever you like and still seeing results, mm. which sounds magical, but it really works. Mm. Yeah, one of the most common things that I hear from from people, and I think this is supported by the science that we have on like how good are people at estimating how much energy is in their food. We're not that great, mm. and most people completely underestimate. You know how many calories did they have for breakfast? If you ask them, they're usually their estimation is usually way under where it was and and actually going through the process of putting it into an app, I find in speaking to people, one of the things that they often say is, wow, I didn't realize how many calories were in my breakfast, how many calories were in my lunch. And then all of a sudden it start, starts to make sense to them as to perhaps why they're not losing weight. And now rather than not understanding or not having a reason, they at least have identified. And then that's that's empowering in and of itself. It's really empowering. Yeah, it's finally understanding okay, what's actually going on and not saying, hey, it's my metabolism, it's my genetics, mm. I'm just born this way. All these things, when you look at the truth, and that's what I do as well with, with my clients and with my team members and with myself. Like sometimes we don't want to look at the truth, right? We're like, okay, I will keep, the, I keep it right there. Yeah. I'll look at it at a later point. But then if you really look at the truth in the eye, then you see what's, what's going right. on. Right. If those three tablespoons of peanut butter don't go into the, uh, <laughs> the calorie tracking app, then they don't count, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you think about it, even like if you do a heap of table, like a tablespoon, like a heap tablespoon, it can make a huge difference mm. or like a handful of nuts. It's, I always make the, make the comparison, which is kind of, it's kind of rough, but it's, it makes it simple to understand. So if you think about an Oreo cookie, maybe it has roughly 50 calories, mm. depends on the Oreo cookie. Now, how much activity does it need to burn it off? It's roughly 1,000 steps, mm. right? So obviously it depends on the person, some people burn more, but roughly per 1,000 steps, you burn 50 calories. Just think about how long it takes you to do those steps, mostly like 10 to 15 minutes to get 10 Ks, 1,000 steps in. And then you realize I'm spending 15 minutes doing activity to have two seconds of enjoyment. And then you see like in relation how some foods are very like energy dense, a lot of calories, mm -hmm. not a lot of nutrients. And some foods are exactly the opposite. They have a lot of volume, satisfy mm -hmm. you, but don't have much energy, like not many calories. So right. when I tell this to my clients, they're always like, oh my God, that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything about this way, it's interesting. Yeah, do you, do you find, do you, any clients like develop a fear of food? If they start sort of thinking like that about, you know, if, if I if I ate, ate this for breakfast, I'm going to have to go and do a certain amount of exercise. Or how do you kind of frame it in a way where people are, are sort of not scared to kind of fuel themselves mm -hmm. um, but are, I guess, being responsible with their calorie intake? Yes, I think what helps them 
not be that obsessive about it is actually understanding why they have this framework and understanding that it's going to help them reach the goal and also understanding that they can have the Oreo. So I'm never saying don't have the Oreo or don't have any processed foods or it might be as long as it suits in your framework that we set up for you or that you set up for yourself, you can have that. And then it empowers them. But also, like you said, it makes them like sensible about it, like makes them just think for one second, maybe, hey, is this a smart choice or not? Mm -hmm. I think this is what many more advanced people do, like you, uh, people who are just into the knowledge and have done it for years. You also like if you go to eat out, you're like, okay, makes is this going to be helpful for me for my goal right now? Um, and then you just pause for a second and then you make the choice, which I think is, right. is definitely, it's like a filter, right? It's like we want to give them the framework so they can approach any situation with like feeling empowered mm. and not going in there and being like, okay, I am vegan keto. So no carbs, <laughs> no rice, no quinoa. Like I can't eat this. It's more of like, okay, this is what I want to do. And this is how it will probably fit in. Mm -hmm. So it's like a more empowering and, and right. free approach. Yeah, I I kind of have my own little strategies that I know work. So if I'm out for dinner with friends and I know that my dinner is going to be a little bit more indulgent and, you know, I'm, I'm really there to enjoy my time. But I usually as well will navigate the menu and often make the most sensible choice that I can within that kind of environment, something that's still enjoyable. And though I might adjust things the next day. I might I might do a fast until midday or I might just reduce my the size of my meals throughout the day and um so I think my kind of intuition there or sort of radar ability to go you know what I've actually I've overconsumed calories today I can I can make some adjustments tomorrow and the day after yes and that's where the intuitiveness comes in right you're like you might feel fuller from that dinner because you had a bit more and then why, why not listen to your body? Why not just fast for, like, why not just skip breakfast and mm -hmm. listen to that fullness and just go with that? That's where yeah, the intuition comes in. So, Do you ever get any pushback online about calorie counting? Yes. Right. <laughs> what, what, what kind of things do people say? Mm, I think, so there's a lot of different camps. One of the pushbacks I get on calorie counting is that people say, as long as you eat enough whole foods, as long as it's unprocessed, has no salt, no oil, no sugar, all these devil foods, calories don't matter. Like you can just eat those healthy foods. We are made to eat these foods. So your body will adjust and all of that. So that's one camp that I get definitely get. Another camp is the camp that is more like, hey, this is too restrictive. It will make you create a bad relationship to food, which I think <laughs> is not the way to think about it. Um, but those are like two camps I get when it comes to calorie counting. And th the interesting thing is, like I said, I'm not a big fan of doing it for life. But I think online, people are trying to make a change, trying to, mm -hmm. to see improvements. I think across the board, most of them would benefit from, from tracking the food and calorie counting. That's why I put it out. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always nuance to a message, right? And I think if you put too much nuance in the message, then you lose a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, hey, calorie counting is, is good, you should do it, then it's, it hits the right people and they might take action and actually right. make a change. And so the primary goal of calorie counting for your clients, like what, what is the, the, the kind of common goal of most of, I mean, I think you've had a thousand plus people go through your coaching program, right? Yes. What are most people looking to achieve? Is it weight loss? So most people are looking to lose weight. Yes, mm -hmm. we can definitely say that. So they come in and they're already eating healthy. So usually they don't, don't come in and they're like, hey, I'm eating French fries and mm -hmm. drinking Coca-Cola. They're already plant-based, mm -hmm. like 90% of them. And they're doing the same thing I was doing, mm -hmm. eating all the whole foods and healthy foods, but still not seeing results, like being frustrated, mm -hmm. putting in the work, but nothing, like nothing happens. What's the average age? Like if, if you were to think of an avatar, describe the typical person. Good question. So I would say typical avatar is... 35 years to 40 years old, um, has a stable job, uh, likes their career, so they they like working, passionate about it. Um, they have a family most of the time as well, um, maybe have kids and are pretty like settled in life. Like they're not mm -hmm. struggling in those mm -hmm. areas necessarily. But then the health, that's mm -hmm. the one part where they're kind of 
kind of struggling and they're not seeing mm-hmm. results, which for them is is frustrating because like, hey, I have my my job figured out, my career, my family life, but I've been trying to get this health thing mm. and get it to work, but I just not possible. I tried this, I tried that. Now I'm trying vegan. Um, and some people just go vegan because of their values, like mm. to, to save animals. Um, but a lot of them also are like, hey, I've realized it's the healthiest way to do it, but it's just not working for me. So that person is driven, is very motivated, very positive. Um, and usually actually from the US, I think we have 90% US mm-hmm. clients as well. Um, that's what I would describe like a typical avatar. Right. Yeah. Okay. So they're coming primarily for weight loss, but also presumably to get stronger. And, and Yes. And Mostly boost. weight loss to get stronger, to do the best they can for their future health. Mm-hmm. Um, some people have some health problems like high blood pressure, mm-hmm. cholesterol. Um, yeah, so it's weight loss, strength gain, and mm-hmm. health optimization. So the calorie counting is really to help them achieve a calorie deficit, mm-hmm. right? And do you ever get a client that's you know maybe had a history with counting calories and just has an aversion to it or doesn't want to c- count calories or do you kind of filter people before they actually start the program and make sure that they're happy to do that? It's a good question, yeah. It's actually, if I think about it, it doesn't happen often mm. that people have a bad experience with it. A lot of people haven't properly done it in the past and a lot of people are just open for mm. for change. They're like, hey, I will do everything you guys tell me to do, right. uh, which is like the best that can happen. Um, we have like here and there, we have people who say, hey, I'm, I don't like track my food. I've had a bad experience. I don't like weighing myself. So since this is a coaching program, we never like just put something onto something that they don't want. Uh, we always work with the client. We obviously have our approaches and the way we do things which are science-based and, and work, but we always still work with a human. That's what coaching mm-hmm. is, in my opinion. So yeah, most people are actually open for mm-hmm. calorie counting, yeah. So come back to your protein in- intake, 180 or 200 grams a day. I think some people listening will be wondering, where does Fritz get that from? Yes. So walk walk me through a typical day of eating. I think you said to me the other day that you often fast through breakfast. So walk us through when when your eating window kind of starts and, and how you get to 180, 200 grams of protein. Yes, good question. So I think a lot of people struggle with their protein take as vegan. So I think it's helpful to break that down. So I like to fast in the morning, meaning I wake up and I just have a coffee and some sparkling water. and then maybe fast for three to four hours. So it's not a typical 16-8 type of fasting because I personally believe that there's no evidence that 16 hours is the magical hour where you can get extra benefits. So for me, it's more like a tool to push out my first meal. And yeah. then I have usually have a smoothie to start the day when I'm home, which is just fruit, frozen fruit, frozen veggies, like even broccoli and peas on there, like just a frozen veggies mm-hmm. uh, mix. Um, protein powder, like two scoops, and then peanut butter. So that's like 300 calories, maybe 50 grams of protein. Mm-hmm. Um, with, uh, with water or? Just with water, yeah. yeah. So pretty simple, straightforward, nothing fancy, no no flaxseed, chia seeds, spirulina, and all these things. I just like to keep it simple. And then what I like to do is I like to have protein feedings every three to five hours, mm-hmm. right? And if, just for a listener to explain, if you want to optimize and maximize muscle gain, it makes sense that you trigger muscle synthesis a few times a day, optimally three to four times a day, and then you can space out your meals. So then three to five hours later for lunch, keep it simple as well, some rice, white rice, uh, some veggies just could be spinach, like sauteed spinach or broccoli. And then what I like is like a pea-based, um, I like TVP, texture vegetable protein, mm-hmm. but based on pea protein. Okay. Um, that I saw that me. they just made that available in Australia recently. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's a lot of products that are coming. So I like that for, for lunch. And funnily enough, for snack, I have another smoothie, like exactly the same one mm-hmm. as for breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, just like you, I like working, I like mm-hmm. producing stuff and getting stuff done. So I'm not the typical guy who's like spending hours in the kitchen and want to maximize my, mm-hmm. my work output. So I maybe spend 30 to 45 minutes a day in the kitchen max if it comes to it. Yeah, I think that's great because I'm the same. Yeah. And I th- I think it's it's often you you 
you would be excused if you were sort of led to believe from looking online at all of the food recipe creators that you need to spend all day creating this stuff, yes. um, which I, I see for – I can see how that would be a little bit worrying for many people. Absolutely. That busy. That's what, I, what happened to me and what happens to a lot of people we help. It's like I found a high-protein recipe, so I need to just soak the nuts overnight. I need to grind – <laughs> need to grind the nuts next next morning. Need to buy this unicorn ingredient, and it just makes it compli- more complicated than it needs to right. be. Yeah, I think there's yeah. space for that stuff. Like, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like actually spending a little bit more time in the kitchen and doing something creative that takes longer. But that's the exception, not the rule. Yes, you know? I mean I agree. I, I used to be a much much better cook, uh, but now it's more more efficient. So then for dinner, usually I I go to a restaurant and go to eat out. Mm. because I like the social aspect of eating out with people. And since I pretty much kept my day pretty lean leading up to dinner, meaning I didn't have like big meals with a lot of calories, I can pretty much enjoy myself for dinner. So I'm lucky to have like 3,000 calories available Mm. um, overall for a day because I'm pretty tall, um, good amount of muscle. Not everyone has this type of spend, of course. But then for dinner, I can have like maybe a vegan burger, maybe um, just a vegan bowl or something, vegan sushi, I can like fit that in mm. for dinner. So that's usually a typical day of eating. So that adds up to 280 grams of protein? Yeah, so 50 grams times two for the smoothies, 50 grams for lunch. So I'm at 150 and then for right, dinner. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, no beans. The beans mostly happen for dinner or I put them in my lunch as well. Right, so yeah. you still do have them. Yes. So correct me if I'm wrong, because I know I often get sent your posts about beans. <laughs> And again, you mentioned nuance, right? Um, and I think sometimes it's hard to convey that. Um, my interpretation of your view on beans is not that they're unhealthy. It's that if you have a high protein intake and you're trying to get all of your protein from beans, you're going to be consuming a lot of total calories and a lot of fiber to get there. So like I can imagine if let's say we wanted to get 180 grams of protein from black beans, that's probably 11 cups of beans. It's roughly two and a half thousand calories and probably nearly 200 grams of fiber. So it's not going to be the smartest strategy for getting all of your protein. Is that kind of where you come from? That's where I come from, yes. Right. And it comes from me trying it. So I was basically the guinea pig for doing that. Um, I tried making it happen. You tried 200 grams of fiber a day? Yes. I think I ended up there at some point, which sounds crazy, but... Yeah, I was I was stacking the beans to get the protein. How did that make you feel? That's a lot of fiber. Yes, I didn't feel good. I mean, I was constantly bloated. I felt slow and my digestion was really all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm coming from. So when I do these videos, obviously I want to be more just pointy so people pay attention mm-hmm. um, because I think, I think especially in the vegan movement as well in the vegan community, a lot of people are very science-based and very like reflected and just are careful what they say, which is great. I mean, I think that's what, what it really is. You can't just say black or white. It's, mm. it's really a, a spectrum, right? But I think it's also helpful to have these, these messages like just put to the point so people understand uh, what they need to look at and maybe mm. change. So beans are totally healthy. You can have them every day and you should probably have them once a day. As studies show that that's mm. beneficial. Um, but if you're trying to get your protein, then maybe don't use them as a protein source. Maybe use them as a carb source in your meal, mm. which has a nice side effect of having some extra protein on top as well. So instead of having maybe sweet potatoes or rice, maybe have yeah black beans, kidney beans, lentils. Um, because the main macro that these beans have, beans and legumes, is carbs. If you look uh, at the macro profile, the carbs are higher than the protein. Yeah, that's not really a kind of debatable fact. It's just a, a truth. Um, it's also important, I think, for folks who are, you know, 55, 60, north of that and are wanting to help maintain or preserve muscle mass, perhaps are eating less total calories because their sort of calorie budgets come down as they've gotten older and, and perhaps are moving less. Um, I know that I, I worked with my mom to tweak a few things in, in her diet to help get her protein intake up a little bit and that was one of them. And it wasn't to remove them, it was just to go – 
to educate her a little bit on the fact that, yeah, there is some beans in, in protein, but there are other plant-based foods that are more protein dense on mm-hmm. a sort of per bite per calorie basis. And using that can be a nice way to kind of increase your protein intake to a more optimal level without blowing out your fiber or your calories. That's right. Right. Yes. Yeah. What do you think of legume pastas? I'm a fan because I love pasta. Like I could eat mm-hmm. pasta all day, every day. So in that aspect, if I want to have a carb source, then legume pasta is a great choice because mm-hmm. I love pasta. It's high in carbs as a carb source, but also packs a good amount of protein. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, big fan, lentil pasta, chickpea pasta. Mm-hmm. Do you get regular feedback from from folks in your coaching program, I should say. And you mentioned before that a lot of these folks have already been eating a plant-based diet. But do you get feedback about bloating, about you know, discomfort if they're sort of ramping up their fiber or perhaps they're already experiencing that when, at the outset, at the sort of beginning of the program based on their the way they have been eating? Yes, so what's interesting is they come to us already feeling bloated most of the time because that's what they follow, the advice they see online. And what we do is we give them the right range of fiber and we give them your plan so they don't have to think about themselves. We just customize it to them, whatever foods they love, and then if we put it into a nutrition context that will work for them and then optimize the fiber as well. So when we give off meal plans, it's optimized for fiber, micronutrients, macronutrients, um, meal timing, protein sources, amino acid profile, like a lot of things mm-hmm. that go into that. Um, and then actually what happens is that seven days in or less, they get rid of the bloating and start mm-hmm. with our nutrition, which is one of the biggest feedbacks we always get, uh, which is amazing because they see it works and they see that they can they don't have to be bloated because a lot of people, they might say, yeah, it's normal on a vegan diet. Like you get used to it. It's just part of it. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe that that should be the case. And I think fiber is the biggest, and there's different things that you can do to reduce bloating, but I think fiber is the biggest difference maker mm-hmm. there. Do you, do you know roughly like how much fibrous people would be getting? So you mean before working with us or? Yeah, both before and, and after. Yeah. yeah, before, I mean, it depends on the person, but at least like 80 grams plus, mm-hmm. right? It depends how much they eat, 60, 80 grams mm-hmm. plus. Um, and just for context, what we tell people what's a good range is 15 to 20 grams of fiber per thousand calories. Mm-hmm. So it gives like context also to the to the to the body and to the to the person itself. Right. But that's gonna get most people north of the recommendations of sort of thirty grams a day or thereabouts. Absolutely. Pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. What type of results are people kind of getting in the program? So t- tell me about I mean the primary goal you sort of mentioned earlier is weight loss. How how are people going? With weight loss, I know that if you look in the in the literature, uh, you know people tend to lose weight with a number of different diets, at, and and can be quite quite considerable amount in the first sort of six months, maybe twelve. But then usually that weight starts coming back on. There's a, a regain. Um, what have you kind of observed? Yes. So since a lot of people come in for weight loss, that's what we focus on, and we make it as simple as possible for them. And the results really vary depending on where they start. Someone who has more excess body fat and more weight to lose, usually they, they lose weight quicker, right? If you just have a little bit of fat to lose on your belly um, to get the abs, then they won't lose as much weight. But we have people losing 20 pounds of fat in three months. We have people who went through incredible transformations, losing 50, 60 pounds in a span of a year um, and really completely changing life around, like getting off medication, lowering their cholesterol, lowering their blood pressure, and just really completely changing as a person. If you look at the pictures, mm-hmm. it's like they they got 10 years younger, basically, mm-hmm. in that yes, time frame. 60 to 100 pounds is that's no small feat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big change. And then usually also, obviously we have people who might lose a bit less weight, but who are trying to look, look a bit leaner and build more muscle. And it's interesting because if you look at literature, like you said, like what happens or what's important is that you sustain the weight loss, mm. right? So there's a lot of like 30-day juice diets right. or like keto diets where you can lose maybe 30 pounds, like 
20 pounds in a month. But what happens is once that's over, they go back to eating normally mm -hmm. and then the weight comes back on. Unfortunately, also there's some research I think showing that it mostly even adds to your belly, right? Mm -hmm. If you gain the weight back, mostly happens in your stomach and then it's really frustrating to lose it again. So mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is get quick results because if you look at it, quick results are going to create more belief, right? So results create belief, I always like, like to say, because a lot of people, they don't believe in themselves. I tried all these things mm -hmm. and nothing worked. And then if they see, wow, well, I'm losing four pounds in the first week in the program, which might sound radical to, to you listening to this, but it creates so much belief and hope mm -hmm. that they continue putting in the work. And then we as coaches, we can still taper the nutrition to not be as aggressive moving forward because mm -hmm. a good weight loss range, I think is losing between 0.5 to 1% of your current body weight per week. Mm -hmm. If you're wondering, Kifrit, how fast should I go? That's the rough mm -hmm. um, like speed you should be looking at when it comes to mm -hmm. weight loss. And the more weight you have to lose, the higher you can be in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Maybe let's break that down as an example. Let's do it. Yeah. Want to use me as an example? Or yeah, you, maybe you can use you as an example. Use you. Okay. Uh, you, you probably know your numbers better, but oh, well, let's just say we're someone that's 80 kilos, mm -hmm. right? How much fat loss would be a, a sort of good target? Per week between 0.4 to 0.8 um, kilograms per week, mm -hmm. right? So... If you have more fat to lose, it's more on the higher end. And if you have less fat to lose, it's more on the lower end. Mm -hmm. But if you are in this range, then you're doing great and you're not losing muscle, which if you're trying to... A lot of people want to lose weight and then do these crazy diets. And what they don't realize is that they're losing muscle as well, right? If you do juice dieting, you're not having any protein, right? You have no, no carbs, like no nothing. Then maybe you don't even exercise. So you're basically eating up your body mm. and you're losing muscle and weight, and then you just end up looking skinny. I think a lot of people want to look toned, right. but then they don't optimize their yeah. There's also macros. quite a bit of, of literature that points to, if you look at weight loss, like the actual weight loss phase, nutrition seems to be the most important thing. Okay, ex exercise is important, but it, it seems clearly that nutrition is like the biggest lever. But then exercise seems, resistance training particularly seems to become more important once someone's lost weight to prevent it coming back on, mm. which I think is often overlooked. Yes, makes a lot of sense. And that's because what happens when you build muscle is your metabolism and the, the amount of calories you burn every day increases because you're carrying around more mm -hmm. weight. And that's like the, the long-term effect of building muscle. Right. You have a bigger calorie budget. Yes. So... Yeah, we focus on weight loss, but also muscle gain mm -hmm. at the same time. So we're not like crash dieting. It's really about like having a sustainable transformation where you're building muscle alongside losing mm -hmm. fat. Yeah, do you ever come up across um, people um, suggesting that there's too much focus on, on weight loss? There's a, a kind of conversation that I see surfacing online quite a bit about... Uh, it, it seems like we've got to a point now where it's difficult to present the science that increased adiposity, which is body fat, particularly if it's around the organs, is not a great thing in terms of someone's risk of chronic disease and even premature death. But it seems like now, even tabling that or discussing that, sometimes can be seen as weight stigma. Yes, I definitely encounter it. I definitely get this feedback too. Mm, because I'm the type of person, I still want to bring out this content because it's going to save lives. It's going to help you realize what being overweight, what being, what having extra body fat mm. can do to you in the long term. And then, like you said, there's feedback coming in, people saying, hey, um, it's about loving yourself like you are. And it's, yeah, weight loss is overrated. BMI, like which is a mm. measurement of just your body composition on a basic, most basic level. Um, BMI is not accurate and all these things. And I think, like you said, it's it's tough nowadays to bring that out. Um, but that's why I'm still trying to do that because um, there's not many people talking about it. Right. Yeah, I think there has to be room for, you, you should be able to take a position that, that having excess fat does increase risk of certain chronic conditions. 
and that's something we should be able to talk about. But at the same time, there's no room for fat shaming or weight stigma. You should be able to hold both of those positions. Um, and, you know, some of that I think comes down to bed, bedside or tableside manners in terms of how, how we discuss it. But I think also when this uh, discussion comes up, sometimes perhaps um, folks that are talking about the effect of, of body weight on disease are also not making it clear that they're not saying that it's all that person's responsibility. And I think it's very clear in the literature that, you know, much of the excess weight or obesity is caused is environmental. And, you know, in, in many cases it's a, a, a product or people are a product of their environment, particularly the food environment. Yes, 100%. That's a good point you're making. I think especially nowadays, um, and I was touching on earlier, like the, the way you surround yourself with your surroundings, like either you, the people you're around or the restaurants you go to, the places you go to, um, it's going to have a huge impact on, on your habits, right? Mm -hmm. We always want to like be in a group of people and we want to adapt to, to the habits and the choices of those people. We don't want to be the, the weird person who's doing something different. Mm -hmm. um, and it totally makes sense. And it's, it's going to have the biggest impact on your, on your choices just subconsciously, right? Because mm -hmm. what happens, for example, I mean, we can all make this example, like when we hang around people um, we are around people who are into working out and eating healthy, then it's it's normal that we go to a healthy restaurant or that we go work out in the morning or go to the sauna. It's normal. It's not a big deal. It's just what we do, right? And I think James Clear talks about this, uh, who is uh, big on the, the habits. And he also talks about how when you have this community feel, it just becomes like second nature mm -hmm. to you. And then when you are around people who are, it's like, why, why are you working out so early? Like, let's, let's go out, let's go party. Um, my eating plan base is weird. And it just makes you second guess and it makes it really hard mm -hmm. to actually make the change happen. Mm -hmm. So that's also why I believe in community a lot. So right. finding the tribe. Yes. That can be difficult though if you have decided you'd like to change your habits, but your current friendship group don't have those habits, all of a sudden you're making a decision there about, you know, it almost feels like you're kind of leaving them behind and saying goodbye to some of those relationships in some aspect if you're going out to seek. Because clearly if you surround yourself with people who are already doing the habits, which is what you're talking about, um, it can be much easier to develop those habits yourself. 100%. And I think it's not a bad thing to evolve from your friend group or from your environment. doesn't mean you have to cut them out and never talk to them again. But I've seen this happen for me. I think life comes in seasons and in those seasons there's people joining you, right? And doesn't mean that in the old season the people are lost or you never talk to them again. But you just evolve with the seasons and if it's important to you, if it's important for you to be healthy long term, to live longer and to be confident in yourself, then you need to make a choice, I think. And unfortunately, a lot of people are not making the choice and they're letting other people make the choice for them. So what you can think about, just, just, just a thought experiment, just ask yourself, what life are you living? Are you living your own life on your own terms? Or are you following someone else's terms without even knowing it? I mean, obviously we all are affected <laughs> by news and people around us, we're not in a vacuum, right? But just think about that. And I think if you think about it and realize you have the power to make the change that you want and you can choose which people you are around. And obviously some environments are different. I mean, I have clients who live in Chicago and then it gets super cold and they mm -hmm. can't go for, for a walk. So those things obviously matter. Environment does matter, mm -hmm. but you can still make proactive choices. Maybe get a walking pad, right? Mm -hmm. And walk at home, just like I have. Right. Just what I'm missing right now. You told me about Bali. that yesterday. Yeah, or if you're in Bali and you're scared of getting run over. You just go on a bike in the right. gym, yeah. Yeah, my steps go down a lot here. So much, right? Do you, do you How many track? steps are you getting here? Oh, should I have a look? It's yeah. kind of scary. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to have a look. Let's have a look. Today I've done 2,000. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it's really like. And if you have a look, so that's when I'm in Bondi. Wow, it's a huge difference. Over 20,000 and then it drops to a couple thousand a day here. What do you do to adapt? 
I usually sit on the bike and do, well, I'll, I'll either do a kind of zone two type session where it's that steady state or hit, particularly if I have less time, I'll go high intensity. Nice. Yeah, or rowing. The rowing machine's good too. I like rowing a lot. I've discovered it recently as well. And yeah, that's how you adapt. I think I that's what happened to me when I first came to Bali like yeah, six, eight weeks ago. I didn't adapt and I was putting on, I was looking softer, putting on a bit of weight and I was like, why is this happening? Oh, it's because I'm on a scooter all day <laughs> and sitting in front of my computer. Right. So Yeah, and one of my fitness trackers that I have, for some reason it actually gets confused and when I'm on the scooter, it picks it up as activity. Really? Oh my God. <laughs> so it's like very misleading <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, yeah. But I know that it doesn't count. I mean, the traffic is very stressful. So maybe no. you're burning some calories there. Yeah. So it could be it accurate. Is. No, you have to, you got to, you need to be very careful. Um, the other way is you can get down to the beach. And mm. that's probably the only real way to get your steps up outside of going to a, to a gym. Probably at the beach, you're burning like twice as many calories per step because right. it's just tough to walk, right? Yeah, that's right. And it's quite steep down there in, in Prairanan or Changu area. Yeah. Um, so that's, it was, we were speaking about habits there. Is that the kind of most critical piece you think for, for folks that are in your program and sort of looking at who, who succeeds and perhaps those who aren't able to adhere to it? Um, how much insight do you sort of have there with regards to how impactful that home environment and social environment is in terms of them being able to stick to it uh, versus say, you know, other factors that you think are really important for developing these habits? It's a good question. I think I can definitely say that the people who are the most successful, they have a very supportive environment. So either they have a supportive family or they are single and they just can set everything up the way they want. And I think people who are struggling to make the habit changes, um, I mean, I have a pretty pretty intense story. Uh, one of our clients, she was like on a good path and crushing it, and then her husband put obstacles in her way by choice. Like he bought treats, he bought chocolate and put it in front of her, like in the cupboard and everything to make her life harder. And she, it was hard for her and she wasn't allowed to like build a, at home workout station, all that. So I think environment can make mm. make a huge difference. That's interesting. Why do you think he wanted to do that? I mean, probably I, because I'm it was you to speculate, but it was probably because he saw himself in the mirror. Like mm. she was a mirror of his habits and his actions, maybe. Right. So he looked at her, she was like losing weight, crushing it, eating mm. healthy. They were drifting apart a little bit, perhaps too. Yeah. They were drifting apart and he was realizing, wow, I'm I'm not putting in the work, so I have to sabotage her to keep her down, mm. maybe, right? I mean, again, we're speculating, but right. it's it's interesting because the people who love you, people don't like change. So when you start changing, like your habits, you go into the gym, you're losing weight, you're finally feeling better. Like when they see that, obviously they love you, but they don't like change. They're like, hey, you are changing. And then they want to mm. like keep you in the old habits and they put like certain identities on you, even right. like, you're always, you are always the person who eats the most or you've always been um, a foodie and all these things, these comments that you get at Christmas table or Thanksgiving, like these really stick with you when someone puts an identity on you. Mm. Yeah, it's sometimes tough to break out of that. Mm. It's like, yeah, I've always been this person, so. Yeah, you're right. Like weird. that whole, you've changed. Change is always, or not always, but very often sort of cast in a, a very negative light. But you, you mentioned before about evolving. And, you know, in, in many instances, change is, is very positive and powerful for that individual and necessary. Yes, absolutely. So if you have family or friends who, who tell you that, um, they still love you. They tell you that because they love you. But then just go internal and ask yourself what's important for you and maybe what people can you add to your life that will make like, your life easier. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what other things, what are like the other top things that might trip people up and, and sort of see them a little bit derailed, so to speak? I think like there's a bunch of things that could happen. Obviously everybody has, and that's interesting because I think a lot of coaches or fitness content is really like complicated and they don't realize that the normal person has a lot of people, go a lot of things going on in their life, like work, bringing kids to school, 
um, there's a problem with the sink, like all these things that come before working out, mm -hmm. right? Working out is not that normal priority or eating healthy. So acknowledging that and then looking at the obstacles and overcoming them like hand by hand would be would be the idea. What are the things I would say? Just on that before you move yeah. forward, um, I think that point you just made then is something the science community need to strongly consider in study design. So when you look at all these studies and we see, because we get real no, insi no insight into who are the subjects from a behavioral point of view. Yes, they lost weight, they regained it, but there's no qualitative information. What mm. were their home circumstances? What were their relationships like? Um, you know, how, how were things at work, stress levels, all of that sort of stuff would, I think, help fill in some of the gaps in the literature. But anyway, carry on. Love that. That's a good point. I think just, I think the biggest challenge, to be honest, like I want to give you the tactical things. I want to say like snacking and like dinner and like social events. But I think the biggest thing is it's in their mind. It's in their head. It's, I mean, mindset is this word you see online, like it's a buzzword, mm -hmm. but it's really like how you think about yourself, about your identity and about what's, what's possible. So a lot of people, I think, subconsciously, they don't really believe in themselves, they can actually do it. And then when things come up like, hey, gym is closed, or oh, I don't have time for meal prep, like those things are tactical things. And we can talk about it too, I have definitely tips. But it's mostly a question of commitment, I think. If you are committed to something, and we all had this, like maybe you had a like a big project we had to finish, like a big test coming up, or these big events in our life, like we are committed to make it work. Like we'll put in the work to get it done and to pass it or like to be successful. And if you treat your health like that, you gotta find solutions. It's, you're gonna be resourceful. You're like, gym is closed. I'll just drop down and do 50 push ups. I always like to say, if you have a floor, you can exercise, mm -hmm. right? You don't need a gym, you don't need equipment. And gravity. And gravity. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I need to add that. Um, and I think if you think about it that way, and just, I think the biggest challenge for people is to get in tune with their why, like, why am I doing this? Then it makes them overcome any challenge. Like we've had people in very challenging situations, especially in the last two years with everything mm -hmm. going on. Um, people losing family members, losing jobs, like all of these things are tough, but because they are, they have this big why and they're committed, they, mm -hmm. they find solutions. And I think that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Someone believing themselves and having a big reason why they're doing it and mm -hmm. constantly reminding themselves. Right. That. And I think some of that is like translatable skills. So you do it in one area of your life. I know like myself personally, let's take the gym for example. You know, I wasn't, when I was 18, 19, I was always pretty strong, but I definitely wasn't like, didn't have a lot of muscle. And I just showed up at the gym all, you know, quite consistently, three, four days a week um, during uni university, enough to start getting the results. And as you said before, that that was, I mean, for me, that was hugely motivating. So I was, you know, I, I had this proven model of just stay stay disciplined, stay committed to something, and and the results come. And that almost act, acted as a template then afterwards in many other aspects of my life with whether it was with studying or in business. Um, so it can actually be quite a powerful sort of life learning experience. Yes, that's why I love exercising and being on a fitness journey because it teaches you so much about life and about yourself and uh, you evolve a lot as you as you go through it. We have people that we that we help. And again, I'm just telling, saying this because I've just seen a lot of stories um, who quit their job, like they lose mm -hmm. 20 pounds, more confident and they're like, I don't want this job anymore. It's not mm -hmm. fulfilling me. I'm not really growing here. So they quit their job and they get a much better job or they get a promotion mm -hmm. or they do other changes because they finally feel empowered right. to, to take action. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible what confidence can do to someone. It's huge. It's what everything. would you say to someone who, let's say they're lacking confidence to or lacking motivation and or confidence to get into the, the gym and they said, Fritz, I understand what I need to do, but I just don't have the motivation. Mm -hmm. So there's different layers here. I think 
one of the biggest layers that I said before is the why. So actually having a reason. I think there's also research on this, actually. I think they had three groups in this one study. Um, and they had, it was about going to the gym, right? And who was the most consistent. And the first group just got told, hey, go to the gym. The second group got told, hey, go to the gym at this time and this day. And the third group got told, go to the gym and write down your why and make sure, like, know why you're going, where you're going, and when when it's happening, right? I probably butcher it. It's not like, mm -hmm. but it's like, that's the, the message of the, of the study. And what they found is that the last group, most of them went exercise, right? And it's because they had a why. They had... They knew where to go and when to be there. Structure. Yes. And meaning. Structure and meaning. Yes. Interesting. And I think those are the two things that are crucial or the three things. And then it's just about putting in the action. And then it just becomes normal. It becomes mm -hmm. the second nature. And like you, like you said, you see the results. So when someone tells me, hey, I don't feel motivated to go to the gym, then we first look at, okay, why is this important to you? And that's like an exercise that may be interesting for listener to try as well it's called the seven levels of why and it's an easy exercise you just ask yourself what's my goal and then you ask why seven times mm -hmm. and as you can imagine it gets really deep like it mm -hmm. starts with hey i want to lose weight because i want to be confident mm -hmm. why do you want to be confident because i want to find a partner for life i want to have a good love life why do you want a good love life and then it's like it gets very deep and you build like a like connection to your why and it's not just a superficial Mm -hmm. trying to be healthy, um, which is a great reason. But why? Like, what's what's it doing mm -hmm. for you? And then it creates this root motivation that helps you wither the storm mm -hmm. of gym being closed, not having time, kids screaming. You're like, okay, I want to do this because of this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what obstacles come up. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get people who perhaps just have an aversion to going to the gym they're just a little bit, um, you know, lacking self-confidence, worried that people are looking at them. Yes, 100%. So we have that um, people don't like being in that environment, people looking at them. So there's always easy solutions. You can always work out from home, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, you can definitely see as great result as well from, from home, especially with everything happened the past two years. Um, I still remember the day everything started with everything being closed down and everything, we had to create like home workout plans for all of our clients, like overnight. <laughs> I was like, this is going to be fun. Uh, but then we really mastered it. So we learned that home workouts can be as effective as, mm -hmm. as gym workouts. So if you listen to this and you don't like going to the gym or it's tough to put in your schedule, start from home. Get some momentum going from home just with your body weight, maybe some bands, maybe some dumbbells. And then you build a confidence and you're like, hey, I actually see muscle, I see progress. You can still progress to the gym. I think not everybody has to go to the gym. Um, it's uh, It can be preference, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it can also provide, for me, it provides a lot of structure. Kind of anchors my days. Mm. You know, it's because back to my question about motivation, I can tell you there are days where I do not feel motivated to go to the gym, but I still, I still show up. Um, and it comes back to the structure and, and it kind of provides a good scaffold for my day. And I know that I just feel better and I'm more, more productive, but then it also taps into, I guess, what's the deeper meaning behind why I'm doing it. I actually like, like that you say that because I think James Clear talks about this as well, that sometimes it's just about showing up, right? It's like set the goal for yourself to just step your foot in the gym, mm -hmm. maybe do the first exercise on your plan. And then you can leave after, mm -hmm. like no problem. But then once you're there, I actually had yesterday, I was on a scooter. I was like, damn, it's a tough workout day. I actually had it today. Uh, tough workout day, busy day ahead. I don't really want to do this, like deadlifts mm -hmm. <laughs> on the plan. Right. And I was like, I'm just going to drive there and see what happens, right? And then I'm there pulling up the app and just, just getting after it. Mm -hmm. So that's a good strategy as that, well. That is a yeah, great tip for folks. Just get there. Uh, you'll find it hard to bail once you're in the doors. Especially when you have people there that you know, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew, right. okay, Simon might be there. Yeah, I'll so be I'm watching like, those deadlifts. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> if I come in and, and the wave. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. Tell me about that. Tell me about uh, how do you personally structure your, your training? 
So currently, I just went through a restructuring a few months ago. So I used to always go to the gym like five, six times a week mm -hmm. and did like typical strength sessions, push, pull, legs, for example. So for the listener, push day is basically every movement where you yeah you push the weight. So it could be bench press, shoulder press, tricep extensions, um, mostly the front of your body. And then you have pull days where you pull the weight. So that pull down deadlifts, uh, all of that stuff. And then leg day is leg day. And now over the past few months, I made a change because I didn't want to spend that much time in the gym anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like working out, but I also realized I have other priorities at the moment. So mm -hmm. I asked myself, how can I train less, quote unquote, because it's not really less, but how can I train less and still have my results and not lose them? So I went from training five, six times a week mm -hmm actual strength sessions to twice a week, full body, which is a great way if you listen to this and you don't have much time mm -hmm. or you're just starting, full body is a great, mm -hmm. great option for you. So do that twice a week and hit all the muscle groups there and then do some cardio on top of mm -hmm. that, like some aerobic conditioning. So hopping on the bike. So how long are those sessions? The full body session is like 70 minutes or 70, 80 minutes. Mm -hmm. So definitely a bit longer than the usual session. Right. But since it's only twice a week, it's um, it's doable. Mm -hmm. And also what I do, just a quick tip, again, if you want to save time, you can do supersets, right? So we can basically have two antagonistic working muscle groups in an exercise. Antagonistic means what's basically in the, op the opposite of the muscle group, right? If you put it simple. Right. So if you do bench press, it's for your chest. And if you do pull-ups, it's for your back. That's mm -hmm. antagonistic. So you can do one set of bench press and then... Mm -hmm. No rest and go right to the pull-ups and um, do the rest after. So that saves you a lot of time. That's what I'm doing in my full body, mm -hmm. full body sessions. Yeah. yeah, and that's a that's a probably a tougher workout because uh, there's less rest overall. Probably yes, right. Yeah, that's why I was like, okay, this is going to be a tough mm -hmm. workout. Um, currently, I'm actually testing something else uh, where I'm even supersetting the same muscle group. Mm -hmm. So doing deadlifts, superset with uh, split squats, mm -hmm. which is tough, <laughs> but it's fun to test. And um, yeah, but currently I'm fo focusing on full body mm -hmm. and focusing on more functional movements too. I right. was always a guy like sitting in the machine, like pressing, mm -hmm. which I don't think is, I mean, it gives you results because you're activating the muscle, mm -hmm. you're stimulating it. But if you do full body movements with like barbell or dumbbell mm -hmm. or even just your body, it just gives this different feeling of um, flexibility and right. functionality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's hard to beat a lot of the kind of core movements, mm -hmm. even though there is a lot of fancy machines which can be, you know, fun and kind of useful here and there. The the core movements definitely for me are, are the kind of foundations of how I would train. At least now. They didn't used to be though. They didn't used to be? No, what I've kind of past? you know, you, you you get distracted by the shiny objects, or at least I did. A lot. Um, I think machines definitely have their purpose. You can you can find some great machines where you can really isolate and and contract muscles in a very kind of specific manner. Um, but for the mainstay of like the volume that I would do, it it's really focused around you know, squats and deadlifts, pull ups, bench press, shoulder press. They're the That's kind cool. of the the main ones. So do you do full body as well? How do you train? I actually have a leg and then a uh, kind of my program's a little bit complicated right now. Um, probably easiest is to say just legs and then a push pull. Um, but I've kind of tweaked a few things recently um, to try and get my frequency actually down a week in terms of the number of times of those trainings because I've wanted to increase the cardiorespiratory training that I'm doing. Mm. So the the kind of more zone two hit stuff. So um, I've gone from kind of resistance training five days a week back to three and getting more volume into those sessions and then that frees up a little bit more time to do the, the zone two, which is time consuming but something that I, I feel like I need to work on. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to test you later on today. Looking forward to it. Yeah, never done the type of test before. But you do a bit of cardiovascular training. Yeah, so I just started it a few months ago. I also try to do zone two training where I'm between 130 to 150 um, beats per minute uh, for my heart rate. And then just 
try to breathe through my nose as well. Mm -hmm. um, right, nasal breathing has been shown to have some benefits too, um, but I'm not too obsessed about it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely trying to increase my improve my cardio because it's been it's shown to have um, benefits, of mm -hmm. course. And I've neglected it for years. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have made the switch. With the clients that go through your program, what principles do you give them or how do you sort of teach them to, to manage their exercise program in a way such that they're continu continually getting progress with regards to strength or body composition? Yes. Yeah, exercise is actually a huge part as well. I think we talk a lot about nutrition as um, as vegans, right? And it's crucial to manage your nutrition on a plant-based diet. But also I think there's a lot of potential missed out on when training. So when it comes to properly making progress in the gym or with home workouts, we really look at a few things. So firstly, the first most important thing is always making sure it's actually set up for the person to work, right? So each person is different. Everyone has a different body. There's a different stage of their life, maybe has had injuries and all that. So we want to have a routine that's firstly built around them and that's tailors to their needs and to the results they want to achieve. And then after they consistently show up, which is the second most mm -hmm. important step, right? We want to make sure that on the one side, we see volume going up every single week, meaning workload in their workouts. So what I mean by that, what I mean by that is you want to see them doing more work every single week, either with sets, with reps, or with using more resistance. When you do that, when you put your body through more resistance, you, you of course, and all that, you stimulate muscle growth or mm -hmm. muscle toning, and then they see more results physically. And what we want to do in our program with our clients, we want to always push them to keep adding more volume, adding more workload. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way to, to really keep growing and keep making progress, both in strength and in looks when it mm -hmm. comes to muscle growth. And I think a lot of people, they go very intense in their workouts. So they sweat a lot, they maybe do high intensity workouts uh, with short rest times and really like put in the hard work and that's great. But sometimes the hard work can be done more efficiently and smarter by just adding more volume versus just completely exhausting yourself which might not add as much muscle mass. I think mm -hmm. high intensity workouts are great for like short intense sessions, but if you really want to build muscle and get stronger, you want to have a consistent plan and consistently get stronger every mm -hmm. week by adding more volume. So let's break that down. If I think within the fitness kind of scene, volume is a, a word that most people understand. So you sort of mentioned there you can add, increase the number of sets. So let's say, for example, we're talking about bench press. You can go from doing three sets of 12 reps to doing four. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to increase the volume. Yes. And then so. you said you could increase the reps. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing those those sets at 10 or 12 reps, you could go up to 12 to 15 reps. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, the last um, way to increase volume is to increase the load. So how do you kind of recommend people navigate that? Obviously, if you keep increasing the sets, I guess, you, your length of your session could be a lot longer. Yes. What's your kind of approach there? Yes, very, very good question. So usually, again, there's different stages when it comes to workout progress. So there's beginners, intermediate, advanced people. For beginners, you might have heard the term before or listen, but I've heard the, the term before, newbie gains, right? So when you start exercising at first, your body is not used to exercising, so it's adapting very quickly. So that means in the beginner stages, I definitely recommend trying to add more resistance, more load to your workouts. So increasing the weight, for example. So if you did 30 pounds of bench press in week one, then in week two, you can maybe do 35 or even 40 pounds. And you can even do that from workout to workout initially. Like your body's really smart and fast mm -hmm. at adapting in the beginning. And it's just the fastest way to progress. So you will see a lot of strength gains in terms of increasing load as a beginner. And again, load can be weight, but it also can be resistance bands mm -hmm. maybe. If you do home workouts, you might not have equipment available. Load can also be increased resistance. Maybe you use the lighter band before, then you can use the, the stronger band after and just make sure you have high resistance. Then once you progress on your journey, maybe you're a three, six, eight months in, and you've pretty much yeah, used all the newbie gains you have. Then at that point, you can still progress with the load, but it's more on a maybe bi-weekly basis, maybe every mm -hmm. two weeks, 
maybe even every month, which sounds low, but if you think about it, if you put on five pounds onto your bench press every month, mm -hmm. that's solid. Like in a few months, you're adding 10, 15, 20 pounds to your bench press. Um, but then at some point, it gets tougher again. Then you might want to work with increasing more sets mm -hmm. um, without like adding sets every single week. Like when the game, the goal is not to do like <laughs> nine sets of bench mm -hmm. press, um, but you can definitely, if you think about it, so the volume is really a formula. It's volume equals sets times reps times workload, like mm -hmm. times load. Mm -hmm. So if you increase either of those, the left side, the volume goes up. Right. So this just helps people understand, okay, I want to get stronger but my muscle. What should I do? Look at each one of those mm -hmm. and see what can I do more this week? Maybe it's just one rep, but right? mm -hmm. it sounds not a lot, but it definitely makes a difference. So mm -hmm. if you add one more rep as well, Instead of eight, you do nine. That will also help you a bit more strength and right. build more muscle. And what about sort of tracking your progress? Is it just a case of kind of casually thinking about how much you're lifting and if it's going in the right direction? Or do you have sort of more um, concrete ways for people to assess, you know, is the gym program that they're currently doing, is it actually serving them? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think this is one of the biggest parts and opportunities for a lot of people, just getting away to tracking their workouts. So nowadays, a lot of apps out there you can use, just apps in the app store where you can put in your workouts and then just track week by week how much weight did I use, how much reps did I do. That's what we do with our clients too. They can put it in the app and we can analyze it for them. And just a way of really measuring your progress because what you measure gets better. And if you then know, okay, last week I did this amount and this week I can try this amount, it really helps. I even sometimes still see people, do you see people in the gym still with a right. notebook and pen? I think that's pretty cool. I actually. like that. It's old school. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of just old, old school bodybuilding. Yes. Um, yeah, quite nostalgic. Um, actually, we were just talking before, I, I saw Axel yes. at the gym. It's funny, we you bump into all sorts of people here. Um, small world, but, and we were talking because he obviously has had his own health journey, um, but incredible to, to see his strength bounce back. He was doing bench press and looking very strong. Yes, yeah, he's had an incredible um, journey and it just shows like what you can do with willpower and also with a healthy approach to life, like plant-based but also training, but also his mindset is very strong. I mm -hmm. think like he's a very, um, just a person that's always seeking to grow and to learn. And I think, um, this has also helped him like yeah. recover this fast, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, I think here when we hear and we see these people working out, there's a lot of vegans here as well, plant-based people in Bali. And it's just great to see like they're all crushing your workouts, crushing your weights mm -hmm. and really not, um, yeah. Not putting a bad light on us. No, right? I, I have uh, been hugely inspired by his his uh, entire journey. As you say, he's got an incredible mindset. I'd love to have him on at some stage and kind of unpack that. Before you mentioned, and I, I should have asked you uh, when you very quickly said that you have two protein shakes a day. And I think you said that each are about 50 grams of rice protein, right? Some people may be hearing that and also maybe folks in your uh, coaching um, program, um, I'm sure say to you, is that healthy or protein powders okay? Is that something that you get a bit? Yeah, we definitely get it a bit. And I understand the notion because I think overall the idea of only eating natural foods or foods that have no ingredient list or that you can look at and it makes sense to you. I like the idea of that. Um, but at the same time, I think being afraid of processed food or being afraid of supplements even, especially in the plant-based lifestyle, can be also pretty detrimental for someone's health, right? And protein powder in itself, if you look at it, it's just isolated protein, right? And what they did is probably the, the used rice or the used pea and just put it in, like extracted the, the protein mm -hmm. and put it in powder form. So I think a lot of times, I think it's healthy to be skeptic about that, right? That's I wouldn't want to buy just any supplement just because I say, hey, it builds muscle, mm -hmm. like increases fat loss. Um, but if you look into the science, 
Uh, and if you look into the ingredients and how it's made, and if you make sure it's good quality, then it's nothing to be worried about. And I think how much protein powder, it really depends on your goals and on your diet. For me, for example, I can eat 3000 calories mm -hmm. um, and then two shakes isn't really making much, much of that intake. Like the rest is mostly whole foods. Mm -hmm. And if your diet is mostly based on whole foods and you have some processed foods to push that protein intake, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it even, in my opinion, improves your health because mm -hmm. it makes you hit your protein needs. So you're not losing any muscle. You're actually feeling satiated from your meals and you recover from your workouts. Right. But yeah. I'm curious, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I, I usually get a couple different questions here. One that I'm not sure if you've seen is there is, I guess, um, it's one organization in particular called the Clean Label Project. And a few years back, they did a report on protein powders and they were looking at the amounts of heavy metals in products. And it got a lot of publicity. So they basically um, created this report and generated a lot of fear around plant-based proteins in particular. And so I get sent this all the time um, because, you know, I, I talk quite regularly about the fact that I too think protein isolates can be really beneficial for someone's dietary pattern depending on their goals. And, and you know, that may not just be someone in their their early years of adulthood who has kind of body composition goals but also someone who is later in life and doesn't have a huge appetite or calorie budget and is thinking about avoiding sarcopenia and osteoporosis. So I think that there is some utility and some benefit to be derived from the inclusion of these powders, protein powders in certain people's diets. And I would also kind of add to that that I'm not a believer that just because something's processed means it's inherently harmful. You know, we can process things and um, and be left with very beneficial compounds. You know, DHA, EPA, algae oil is an example of that. Mm -hmm. That's a that's processed, um, but I think most people would agree that that is beneficial, particularly for folks um, eating diets that have um, minimal or, or no seafood. Um, but anyway, the Clean Label Project kind of came out. And I'm going to say they created a bit of a storm. They did. And, and I understand because they essentially came out and said, these products contain heavy metals um, and listed them, arsenic and um, a bunch of others. And um, they then um, set up a, a for-profit kind of accreditation mm -hmm. um, program to, to say, well, if you come to us, um, we'll measure your your protein and will certify you so you can be one of the few that can go out and say that your product is safe. Now, a lot of they got a lot of backlash. There was a lot of backlash over this. And that was because with any of these compounds, we know that heavy metals are in all sorts of foods. Um, and um, even when we eat, you know, the the full for the full whole food, the black bean or the pea before it becomes pea protein or the soybean before it becomes soy protein, there are heavy metals in there. And when assessing whether a, a food is harmful and should or shouldn't be consumed, it's not just about is the heavy metal there, um, was it measurable, it's it's more around the exposure level. So is it within safe limits or is it above? And they didn't look at that. They were just looking at its uh, existence within these foods. So they were just detecting it, measuring it, detecting it. Um, but their analysis didn't look into the actual exposure level and toxicology studies looking at um, what are the safe thresholds. So then in 2020, um, after a great debate, there was a, a paper, and I'll put this in the show notes, by Bandara et al. And this was published with no conflicts of interest, no industry funding. I thought that that was important. It was one of the first things I looked at because I thought, well, if someone's going to come out defending plant proteins, maybe it's going to be the supplement industry. Um, anyway, so they, they were interested in looking at exactly this. So the levels that are detected within plant protein supplements, are they 
below or above a safe threshold. And so they, they went through and looked at all of the literature that we have on how much of these heavy metals are in plant proteins and then um, comparing that with what the known safe thresholds are. And I'll read from you their conclusion. Um, this is a long-winded answer to your question. But I like um, this study presents a screening level risk assessment investigating whether protein powder supplement ingestion is likely a significant source of heavy metal exposure and whether this exposure poses an increased risk to human health. The data in the current study suggests that heavy metal exposure by protein powder supplement ingestion does not pose an increased non-carcinogenic risk to human health. Further, no carcinogenic risk was expected via ingestion of protein powder supplements. This study demonstrates that health risks of heavy metals in protein powder supplements should be conducted within the context of relevant background exposures and established health-based standards instead of the presence of hazardous substances alone. So essentially, they're basically saying we shouldn't be saying whether a product is is good or not based on whether it, it has heavy metals in it, but whether or not those heavy metals are above or below a safe threshold. Um, so long answer to your question, but um, I don't think anyone should fear protein powder supplements. Um, I think they can be a valuable inclusion in someone's diet depending on their goals. Yes. I love that you, you dug that up. I think that's why I love your show because you just look at the science and you present it in a neutral fashion, like just the, the facts and what it says. And it helps people not be afraid of stuff like supplements and, and all of that. And like funny side story, just my, my parents, when they started their weight loss journey, um, they were also sending me pictures of like, hey, I'm having a high protein meal. And then it was just like, yeah, quinoa, chickpeas and, and veggies. And then I slowly but surely showed them the way with protein powder. And um, I now installed the habit that they have at least one serving of protein powder like in the morning with their oats and maybe also in the afternoon and just getting in the habit. Also finding a protein powder that's tasty sometimes can be, can be tough, mm -hmm. uh, good plant-based protein powder. Mm, but once you have that going, it's really actually also enjoyable. Like it makes meals tastier. You can have sweet versions of your oatmeal, of your smoothie, protein pancakes, and you can bring it anywhere. Like mm -hmm. I know a few people and I do it myself. I bring my protein powder to restaurants sometimes and just tell, tell them, hey, can you put it in a smoothie, please, or in a smoothie bowl? Because sometimes they don't have it available mm -hmm. and it just makes life so much easier and um, it's mm -hmm. also healthy for you. So BYO protein powder. Yes. <laughs> um, very cool. The other thing that I would add on that is I've had um, quite a few different conversations on kind of longevity. Uh, and, and sarcopenia and osteoporosis, which I mentioned before, and discussions around like how much protein should we have, how much is enough, what's optimal, is increasing our protein intake, is it benefiting some aspects of health but then coming at the cost of longevity. And I will say my view of this is one that is evolving and it's based on what I know today and it could change. Um, but I guess what are some of the things that I think are most clear? So I would, I would say that from a, a body composition strength point of view, it's pretty clear that you, you do want to consume 1.6 grams per kilogram or possibly a little bit more um, if it's plant protein. Um, however, consuming that amount and not doing the resistance training and focusing on the volume and whatnot isn't going to deliver magic, uh, muscle sort of magically out of nowhere. So you have to have the stimulus there, but then that 1.6 grams or a little bit higher does seem to be optimal if that's your goal. Um, now there's some debate around, okay, well, if someone's not looking to absolutely optimize their, their sort of muscle and body composition, how much do they need? And, um, some folks argue that the RDA is right. Some argue that it's more around 1.2 grams per kilo. Um, all I can say on that is it probably doesn't matter too much because the average person is getting about 1.2, 1.3 grams per kilogram anyway, including vegetarians usually, um, or plant-based folks. So it might be a little bit of a moot 
point. Um, so I think targeting that 1.2, 1.3 grams along with an active lifestyle as a minimum, you know, for someone who's maybe not trying to absolutely optimize body composition, seems like a sort of fair position. Um, again, with exercise being the most important factor. Um, and then I think source is important. Mm -hmm. And there are different views out there, but I think it's pretty clear that if you look at the chronic diseases that are affecting people, particularly cardiovascular disease, um, that there's huge benefits by eating less animal protein, more plant protein. And this is actually where I do like the slightly higher protein intake because we know when you get to a slightly higher protein intake, there doesn't seem to be any difference between animal protein and plant protein from a hypertrophy strength point of view. Um, kind of having the high total protein intake seems to negate any um, differences in, in the outcomes there. Um, so leaning more into tofu and tempeh and beans and, and those foods and um, beans, we'll come back to that. Uh, <laughs> I know you, we, 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 we mentioned that earlier, but, but eating more of those foods in general um, and of course prioritizing the sort of high – protein plant-based foods um, that are very protein rich on a per calorie basis. Maybe we can go through that. Um, I think that when you sort of put all that information together, it sort of looks something like this, you know, consume at least 1.2 grams per kilogram. If your goal is body composition and strength and you're working out really hard and you want to recover and you want your body to adapt, get it north of 1.6 grams per kilogram and ideally eat more plant protein, less animal protein and do that to whatever extent feels right for you based on um, your circumstances and, and what you value. I love that. And I love that you say that focusing on plant protein versus animal protein already has huge health benefits because I think sometimes um, we forget about the benefits that plant side has and we think about, okay, how do I get more protein? And I, I'm guilty of that. I'm always looking to get more protein, which sources, but I... Sometimes I remind myself and you just reminded all of us that already choosing plant protein is already doing so much for our health. And I think a lot of people mm -hmm. here listening or watching, that's the number one goal. Obviously, right. they want to look good, but also for long-term health. And if you're already making that switch, and that's when I made the switch as well back in the days because I was eating all the chicken mm -hmm. and all the dairy products. And when I realized, oh, long-term, it could have some adverse effects mm -hmm. on my health, I realized, hey, Yes, I can gain maybe a pound of more muscle, maybe, um, even if it's not the case really. But do I want to sacrifice my health for that? I have a higher risk? Not, right. not, not my choice. Right? Yeah. One, there's a lot of studies that have been very powerful um, to me that kind of speak to this. But, um, you know, my, I think when I was on your show, I told you my dad had a heart attack at age 41. So cardiovascular disease for me has always been something that I've been – super interested in learning more about and trying to figure out ways that I can take better control of my health, um, particularly with respect to my cardiovascular system and, and try and avoid going down that same path. And if we look at the average person's um, sort of LDL cholesterol level today in society, it's about in Western countries, it's about 120 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and there's, there's so much science looking at um, LDL cholesterol levels and, and atherosclerotic plaque. So we can look at um, different people over their lifetime who have different LDL cholesterol levels and take a peek inside of their arteries using ultrasound or other methods and look at how much plaque they have. And it's really clear that um, when... When someone's LDL cholesterol level, remember I said the average person is about 120 to 130. They're living the standard Western lifestyle, but you know, typically most people that are eating a lot of animal foods are, are thereabouts, even if it's a sort of paleo diet. It might even be much higher if it's a kind of carnivore diet. Um, we see that once it's at about 80 milligrams per deciliter or lower, and those that have listened to the episode I did with Alan Flanagan and Danny Lennon will, will remember this. Once it's at about 80 milligrams per deciliter or lower, you don't see any buildup of that fatty plaque in the artery. 
And that fatty plaque is what's responsible for obstruction of blood flow. Um, and, and ultimately um, that obstruction of blood flow can lead to a heart attack or, or to a stroke. And what you see is folks who, who sort of get very lu- lucky, the genetic lottery they win, and they have a kind of genetic um, sort of uh, polymorphism, they call it, or a gene mutation sounds like a bad thing, but it can be positive, that causes them to have very low LDL cholesterol levels, 30 or 40. And these people are just heart attack proof. They they can go out and live in the Western um, environment. And despite living in that environment, they're even still, they're not developing atherosclerosis. Um, They're not having heart attacks, the number one cause of death. So where I started with this is that there's a, a powerful study by Bergeron et al. And this is 2021 high level randomized controlled trial looked at what happens to these um, lipoproteins, the ones I'm talking about that we want to keep down when you eat different protein sources. And they, they looked at red meat, they looked at white meat, so poultry, and they looked at plant protein. And they actually set this up in a way that if anything was favoring animal protein because in those three groups, they matched the saturated fat content. And if you think about it in real life, when you swap uh, red meat for plant protein, you'd actually, for in most cases, if not all, you get a reduction in saturated fat, which would lower your cholesterol. So they evened the playing field a bit. Um, and even with the playing field, even they still saw a significant reduction in these atherogenic lipoproteins. And so with the average person at 120 to 130, cardiovascular disease being the number one cause of death, you know, when people say to me, what's the kind of simplify your nutrition message down? It's eat more plant protein and eat more fiber. And going back to your um, earlier points on fiber, obviously to the extent that you can tolerate it. Yes, that's very powerful. And I love that you also share that there's always these genetic yeah, exceptions as well. And I think nowadays, especially on on social media, with some people bolstering a certain diet and uh, pushing certain approaches to, to nutrition, to healthy nutrition, what they think it is, um, people forget, like we as humans, we forget um, about survivorship bias, right? So if you look it up, it basically means that there's always going to be like one person gets more attention, which might have this genetic mutation, which is not affected by these diet choices. But there's going to be millions or thousands of people that you don't see because they're not on social media or they not, don't have a big following um, that would have maybe negative side effects mm-hmm. from, from those choices. And that's sometimes what people forget, I think, as well. So it's good that you, you bring it up. Mm-hmm. Which is also a good reason a reminder to not place too much stock in the anecdotes and you know they can be interesting but when you look at the literature and you're looking at hundreds of thousands of people followed for 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 years in different populations asian populations european populations american populations um australian populations and you see the same things you can be a bit more confident that this is the typical result that you'll get when you adopt the same kind of lifestyle. Um, One last thing I would add to protein is I had a conversation with Walter Longo and his, I mean, I find his work really interesting. He's been on the show twice. Um, I think he's doing some incredible stuff as, as all of these guys are, you know, they all kind of, they agree on some things, they disagree on, on certain things. And, um, I guess I see my role as trying to synthesize a lot of that information. But um, I think Volta Longo, he spent a lot of his research looking at IGF-1, this hormone that is typically increased through protein. Animal protein increases it more than plant protein. His research has showed that. Um, and his research has also looked at um, some people in South America who have a gene mutation which keeps IGF-1 very low. Um, they're actually very short in stature. Um, and they live uh, a very long life and have very low incidence of chronic disease. So that is, that's an interesting kind of observation. Um, so 
where I'm getting at with this is I mentioned before that sort of 1.6 grams or higher than that is um, seems to be optimal from strength and body composition. Uh, I know that you've looked at that literature as well. Um, I think another big advantage of, the, of, che- of leaning into plant protein there is that it's likely to raise IGF-1 less than, than animal protein. Um, and it is an association between IGF-1 and, and mortality, so it's by, by no means sort of concrete. But I think there's enough evidence to say, you know, if you can eat more protein and keep your IGF-1 levels down, it's probably a sensible idea until we know more. And eating more plant protein as opposed to animal protein um, is likely going to do that. And um, I'm actually going to get my IGF-1 level tested. Um, I had a few emails going back and forth with Volta after and he, he, um, he said basically you want to be between 130 and 150. Um, I forget what the unit measurement is but I'll put that into the notes. Um, so I said to him, if I'm consuming a sort of moderate to high protein but it's all from plants and my IGF-1 level is within that healthy range, do you think that's a problem? And he said no. So um, I'm going to test my IGF-1 levels and report back. Yes. I love that you're always doing these tests and, and sharing your results. I, I want to do that more. I think we did a test on, uh, I think last week, mm-hmm. the lactate test, which I've never done before, which was super interesting. Mm-hmm. And do you want to talk about the results? Yeah. Um, well, we've both done it. So my my results were... I believe my um, my heart rate. So when I cross the my lactate threshold, which maybe we need to kind of explain what that is. Um, there's been some conversation about this, but in in short, um, and I do have a guest coming on uh, in the coming weeks to kind of deep dive this, a scientist. So I'll give you a very short explanation here. But essentially, um, the the kind of lactate test is looking at um, your metabolic health as a kind of high level. It's zooming in and looking at what fuel you're using during exercise. And interestingly, if you look at people with metabolic syndrome, so poor metabolic health, they will switch from using fat for fuel to using glucose for fuel at a very, very low power output and the reason that's a problem in short is that when you when you're running off fat you can you can typically run a lot longer and you're not producing compounds like lactate which cause fatigue it's one of the reasons um so someone with metabolic syndrome let's say for example they might just walk up a a slightly steep hill and switch from burning fat into um, glucose or a blend of these and be producing lactate and feel very fatigued. Whereas someone who is moderately fit or very fit, they're going up that hill and they're just running off of fat and they're not tapping into glucose, their glycogen stores, save that for later, um, and they're not producing lactate. Mm. Okay, so um, the lactate threshold is essentially looking at What's the point in terms of power where at power output, so in this case on a bike watts, where you switch from using pretty much all fat or the maximum sort of fat oxidation that's occurring in your mitochondria to tapping into glucose. And when you know that, you can then go, okay, well, I'll just sit on that threshold or just shy of that threshold in a 45-minute or 60-minute cycle. And I'll force the body to adapt such that your threshold shifts. So for me right now, I believe my threshold is, I'm going to say 140 watts, 135, 140 watts. It's a heart rate of about 130. Um, Usually that threshold is about 65 to 75% of your max heart rate. My max heart rate is about 190. Um, So... Now I know through doing that lactate testing and um, just for folks that are are sort of not familiar with that, it it requires a little um, sort of lancet prick to your finger and then this little machine, similar to a machine that someone may use to measure their blood glucose, their um, diabetes, 
just you, you put the blood droplet on to, onto one of these tabs and it tells you in millimoles what your lactate level is. So um, what we did was get on a bike, you do a very low um, power sort of uh, warm up, you're measuring your lactate and then every five minutes you, you're cranking it up in a, a very um, sort of systematic way and measuring lactate along the way. And when you get over two millimoles per liter, that's the lactate threshold. So what you're looking at is, okay, what's my heart rate and what's my watts when I'm getting to that point? And then you see a big inflection and lactate starts to rise really quickly. So, um, yeah, 130, 140. What was yours? Mine was between 120 and 135, I think, mm -hmm. watts and also heart rate like 120, 125. So... Um, yeah, I'm excited to to test it, and I think like doing these tests like could be a blood like regular blood tests or lactate tests or um, IGF one testing. Um, depending on what you wanna like what you're working on, what your goals are, um, I think are super important for long term health. And I think a lot of vegans would definitely benefit. So when we someone when we take someone on in our program, we also always say them say to them tell them hey get a blood test mm -hmm. so we can see what's really going on. And obviously we are not doctors, but just seeing like which nutrients they're maybe missing, maybe they're deficient in some certain nutrients, uh, which some vegans can be, mm -hmm. um, is very helpful to redetermine what do I need to work on. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. For me, um, I guess doing that lactate testing, it's, it's definitely, I'd say, I'm going to use the word motivation. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, the right word. I think actually it just makes it more fun um, because now yeah. I know in three to six months' time you know, I'm going to test again um, and, and I think I'm going to be more disciplined because I know that that test is coming um, and so it's a little bit of a fun challenge, I guess, to myself to stay disciplined, stay stick to the path and try and do the two to three times a week. Yes, that's good. Yeah, I think... With strength training, you obviously have goals to get stronger each week, but sometimes we miss this this big like event or something we are working towards. So this is a great example mm -hmm. that helps you stay on track, stay motivated. Also got some I posted results on my stories and got some um like one uh ultra marathon guy uh, reached out and was like, Hey, you need some work <laughs> on on the zone too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think like to be honest, where you and I sit is probably it's what most people would predict. I mean, we haven't been doing a ton of zone two. Um, you know, the, these guys that are cyclists are sitting in zone two for many hours a week. Um, so I think the, the kind of where we're coming from is actually sort of in line with where a moderately active person would sit. Um, we don't have metabolic syndrome, which is great news. That's a, that's a positive, right? <laughs> um, but even someone with metabolic syndrome who who can is looking to improve their health, this is something that they they would really want to think about. Um, in addition to obviously their nutrition, you mentioned nutrients, doing blood tests, um, and on this show and in my book, and gotta put my vegan cap on. Yeah, for that. yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Props. Uh, there we go. You're a brave man. Let's <laughs> let's 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 let's. Go. let's Let's talk about that hat first. That's a statement hat. Yeah. Right. Let's talk about it. So I've been starting to wear this, I think it must have been a few months ago. Um, so for me, when I work out, I want to have a hat on because I, for some reason, like it makes me mm -hmm. more focused, right? If you have the hat on, you just have like, this tunnel vision. <laughs> and also like because of my, my hair, which has been growing right. a bit longer. And I kind of wanted something that is different and that gets a little bit of attention. So I'm not a typical, like I don't need my attention. I would say I'm also more of an introvert as well. But I just like the feeling when someone looks at me, see like me doing bench press or curls and just me, see me that I'm actually pushing weight and strong as a, as a plant-based person. Just kind of like that feeling. And I think it's a subtle way to bring out the message. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been wearing it for a few mm -hmm. months now. Yeah, you're braver than me. <laughs> No, I um, kudos to you. Yeah, what are I your think, thoughts on? I work? think if you, I mean, it's it's not me, um, but I don't say that in a in a kind of um, 
in a mean way. Um, I think it looks good on you. Um, and, and I think the fact that you can do it, I think you're very brave. And I just personally don't like people looking at me. So, or like yeah, staring, you know, I, I feel like that's just yeah. sort of, um, for me, I'd feel probably a little bit uncomfortable. Um, probably more introverted, I think, than, than people may realize. But um, I think if you can rock it and you're comfortable in it, then you do you. I think it's super interesting because sometimes I think we are in this vegan fitness bubble, like us people who are into the science, into working out, and we know like it's possible. Like mm -hmm. get your protein in, right. get your workouts in, like carbs, it's all mm -hmm. good. But we forget that there's literally like 99.9% .9 of people who don't know what vegan is or right. who think it's not possible at all. So mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, just showing these people mm -hmm. we're out there, we're okay. doing our thing. And I see a lot mm -hmm. of people also coming up to me and asking me about it, which is interesting mm -hmm. and helps me maybe mm -hmm. help some people out. And yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe that's my challenge. Maybe yeah. I'll, I'll try it for a week. Give it a try. Give it a shot. What happens if no one comes up to me? I need to work out more. Gotta get more gains. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta eat more beans. <laughs> more beans. <laughs> uh, speaking of beans, we've already covered it, but you, you said before to me that Axel was in your comments. Yeah. What, what did Axel have to say about the beans? So I think um, he had a fair point. So he, um, he made the comment that beans are a great protein source. And then he said that I include soybeans in my great protein source, but I usually say tofu and tempeh are great mm -hmm. protein sources, which are made of soybeans. So he has a point, right? It's not the pure version, obviously, like they're processed uh, into tempeh and tofu. Um, but yeah, it's just some some fun banter, and we talked about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. right. And um, he knows that it's, for me, it's like just really putting out the message to to help people understand, like mm -hmm. just a basic message, and then you can always I still have beans, right? I, I used to eat them, so okay. Yeah. Beans are, are still on the menu. Um, so the micronutrients and, and blood tests, right? So this is where we kind of started and you put your hat on. Yeah. Um, so on this show, we've spoken at length about micronutrients. I wrote about them in my book, but I'm conscious that maybe someone's jumping into this episode for the first time. Like you said, there are many people who are still not familiar with what vegan diets are and what nutrients they need to consider and maybe they've heard certain things and it's not clear. So with folks that go through your program, what specific nutrients, I guess, do you kind of draw their attention to and say, hey, just make sure you're planning for these? Yes, love the question. So there's a lot of misconception, I think, um, out there still that vegans are not getting any micronutrients and they have to be very careful and you have to take all these supplements to get everything in. You can definitely, you can definitely hit most of your micronutrients with a plant-based diet without having to supplement them. There's a few key though that you really want to pay attention to. So first one, I think this easiest one, B12, right? So every vegan needs to um, supplement B12 because we just don't, not able to get it from food. Yes, there's fortified foods. But I would just go to safe route and just supplement mm -hmm. it so you, you don't miss out on anything. And the interesting thing is, unfortunately, I see a lot of people still that I talk to that reach out to me or even friends that are vegan who don't supplement B12 and like, hey, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm mm -hmm. fine. But you probably know that the side effects, the B12 deficiency might not kick in in the first right. month or for six months. It might mm -hmm. kick in a few years down the road and then it's really dangerous, right? Right. Then, you know, what damage has been done? Yes. In that time. So yeah, I'm with you. Just supplement it. Yeah, just supplement it. Then second one I would say is vitamin D3, which is not specific for vegans necessarily. I think everybody, in my opinion, benefits from supplementing vitamin D3, which you mostly get from, from the sun, right? Um, but for vegans, I would definitely recommend supplementing it too and paying attention to it. Super healthy, super important for you. Third one I would say is omega-3 from an algae-based source so mm -hmm. you want to get epa and dha and i think a lot of vegans i think that if i have just have the flax seeds and the chia seeds and the walnuts i'm getting omega-3 and yes they're great omega-3 sources but they come with the ala version mm -hmm. of omega-3 right which has to get converted into the epa and dha and the conversion i think it's like 10 percent is pretty low right um into epa yeah, dha which, i think it's 10 percent for epa and a little bit less for dha 
Yes. And if you want to have the benefits of omega-3, then you want to have the EPA and the DHA. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I recommend supplementing omega-3 as well on top of that. And then there's some other nutrients which sometimes in, in certain studies, some studies show, hey, some vegans are mm -hmm. calcium deficient or iron deficient um, or lower in, in calcium and iron. So what I like to do with our clients is if they have a blood test, then we can look at that and we can recommend increasing the intake there. Again, we're not doctors, but we're just uh, making recommendations. But what I'm a big fan of is like a multi-mineral mm -hmm. that has, that's basically helping them hit like a baseline um, of micronutrients mm -hmm. for like calcium, iron, and just to, just to be on a safe side mm -hmm. too. Obviously and there's iodine, some, which is usually in yes, those. Iodine too, true. Yeah. Um, which obviously you want to be careful not to overshoot. Mm -hmm. Calcium and iron specifically, right? But if you just have a small amount of it from mm -hmm. supplement and then the rest from your diet, then right. um, that should help. So those are the biggest ones we look at. Creatine is also, mm -hmm. it's not essential, I would say. It's very beneficial, so you can al almost call it essential because there's so much research out there, why would you not take it? Um, but creatine is very helpful for strength output, power mm -hmm. output in workouts. And I think there's also some research on um, memory, right. improves memory yeah. in vegans. Right? Emerging, emerging research. I think it's really something that everyone should supplement whether they're eating meat or not because you'd have to eat a huge amount of meat to get five grams a day mm. um, and that wouldn't be so healthy yes. for you. So, um, yeah, uh, the, the other sort of recommendation that I often give with calcium is, and I think your recommendation is a good one, um, is like I know with the plant-based milks that I buy, I usually buy ones that are calcium fortified as well and that that will generally provide an extra sort of two or 300 milligrams of calcium per day if you're having a cup or so of that. That's nice. That's a good one actually. I like that. Yeah. Um, I would say those are the most important ones. And I yeah. think just to add on here, just a quick comment as well. I think in the vegan community, there's a lot of focus on micronutrients, which is great. Like again, there's a lot of nutrients you want to pay attention to, like we just talked about. But sometimes they forget about the macronutrients and optimizing them, right? Because if you want to have a healthy life and also a healthy body, macronutrients are just as important, if not more important maybe to do that than micronutrients. I mean, the name already says it. One is micro, one is macro. So don't just pay attention to your micronutrients, but also to your macronutrients like proteins, fats, and carbs, which we already mm -hmm. touched on. And on DHA and EPA, I'll put a link to a new review that the Shares Eyes, have you come across them? The neurologist based in California. They did a, a new uh, review on omega-3s, DHA, EPA, um, that has a lot of really tremendous information, sort of up-to-date information in there and um, including their sort of recommendations for plant-based folks, which is um, as a precautionary sort of principle to supplement with DHA and, and EPA. Amazing. Um, okay, so speaking of, of nutrients, what are, what are your thoughts on juices? <laughs> juices often come up as a, you know, a very micronutrient-rich drink. Do you drink juices? Do you recommend them? How do you sort of compare them to smoothies, for example? Yes, juices come up a lot, I, I agree. And especially now, like here in Bali as well, like juices are everywhere. In every healthy cafe, you can get green juices mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. When's the last time you had a juice? It's been a while. I think, honestly, probably for taste, like a few months ago. Just sometimes I like the taste of like celery juice with like maybe some mint and apple taste. But in itself, how I think about juices is they're just stripped off a lot of good stuff. For example, the fiber, right? And if you think about a, a fruit and a, a vegetable, it's not the, not just the nutrients like in the fruit itself, like what happens to the the excess that gets thrown away when you when you put it in a juicer, mm -hmm. right? So we miss all of those nutrients, and it's just compared to a smoothie the nutrient profile is just much worse. And especially when it comes to trying to get your protein, get your carbs, get your fats, it's right. basically completely stripped off mm. um, when it comes to juices. And I think it's mostly mostly marketing really mm -hmm. uh, at, at this level. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I would say, look, I personally rarely have a juice. So maybe I'm biased. Um, but there's a reason for that. I, I think that that... I use smoothies 
um, to get a better balance of fats and protein and carbohydrates. I think the real juices I think that one should be a little bit more careful about is when they're you know, just sort of mango or apple and you can really concentrate the sugars in there um, and you strip the fiber away. I'm not sure that's such a good thing. If someone's metabolically healthy, they can probably get away with it. But then as someone goes down the spectrum and their metabolic health is not great and that's probably the majority of society, I think there's probably better options than having a very high sort of calorie carb um, food that you can consume very quickly and is probably not that filling. I'd say satiety is pretty low yes. given – fibers out there's no protein or very minimal protein um, so i think comparative speaking probably not a, a huge fan of juices but if i was going to choose a juice then i'd be leaning more into the vegetable juices so a little bit less of the apples and the mangoes and the sort of more higher sugar um, fruits that become very concentrated in sugars when you blend them because you can get you know how many apples into an apple juice a lot, a lot yeah. right? Um, so I would prefer someone ate the apple um, instead of doing that. But I think that, you know, some of the, the more vegetable juices, like the green vegetable, fresh juices, whether it's like celery or spinach and cucumber and those sorts, um, I think are, are different to the, the sort of fruit-based ones. Yeah, that's good. I think a good point you made there with satiety, right? It's a, it's a huge point as well. Like any liquid calories that you consume are just not as satisfying as um, as real food that you have to chew. Uh, how you want to think about it is when we chew, we're basically sending signals to our brain that we are, we're eating. And when you think about, okay, how do I get hunger cues? How do I get appetite? It really all happens in your brain. It starts in your brain. It starts sending signals to your body, like to your, that's why you have this maybe this growling in the stomach or you feel hungry. Like it really comes from your brain. And if you're not chewing and you, you're drinking most of your calories, maybe smoothies or juices, um, then it can work. You can definitely have them, not like yeah, bad to have, but it could just make it a bit harder to to stay satiated mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. on your diet if you're trying to mm -hmm. improve your composition. Do you get? Uh, I bet you do. When when people are eating in a calorie deficit, do you get people contacting you saying, "Hey, look." I'm just super hungry. I've got a lot of cravings, finding it hard to kind of sit in this calorie deficit. How do you kind of workshop that, I guess, to A, work out is the calorie deficit the right deficit for them and B, like what what sort of words of advice or tips could you give someone like that to sort of help help manage that and, you know, so they're not finding themselves sort of caving and, and over-consuming ice cream and cookies because they just have these – these cravings that they can't get rid of yes very good question and this is definitely coming up uh, on on a diet when you're trying to lose weight but before that you want to ask yourself if it comes up very early on your journey to to losing weight and getting healthy then you want to ask yourself is the deficit set up the right way for your body and for your activity levels and for your needs because if you set up the nutrition in a way where you get all the macronutrients, all the micronutrients, and you have certain foods included that are going to give you more volume. I will talk about the tactics in a bit. Then, and the calorie deficit isn't as high, so it's healthy for your body and for your for your metabolism, for how many calories you burn every single day. Then you actually won't feel hungry most of the journey. So, mm -hmm. what will happen over time, and what happens to our clients? So they get a diet set up, and then they're just super full. And they're satisfied, and they're crushing. We even get messages like, hey, we can't finish the meal. Like it's too much food and I'm losing weight. What's what's going on? What's the magic, right? And if you keep losing, if you keep losing weight and getting leaner, at that point, at some point, yes, you're gonna have more cravings and more hunger because how you want to think about it, you're losing body fat. Mm -hmm. So back in the days when we still had to hunt for food, that basically meant, hey, I'm dying. Right. Like not getting any food. So I gotta go hunt. Mm -hmm. So it starts like your body starts sending you signals. Hunger mm -hmm. signals, hey, get food, like mm -hmm. um, go hunt down mm -hmm. some food. It's and protective. It's looking out for you. It's looking out for you, exactly. So if you want to get like very lean for a photo shoot or just like mm -hmm. to review your apps and to look good at the beach, then maybe at some point you reach a point where, mm -hmm. yes, you're eating all the healthy foods, you're eating all the macros and you're hitting everything, but you're still kind of a little bit hungry. Right. But the interesting part is most people are not at that point. Mm -hmm. 
they still have a lot of fat to lose, but already getting hungry. And at mm. that point, the first question I would ask myself, is my deficit too high? Am I eating? I see mm. some people come to us, they're saying, hey, I'm eating 1,200 calories. Right. I'm eating 1,000 calories. So in that example, the body's sort of interpreting the size of the deficit and like the rate of tapping into fat. And even though there is additional fat, the body is essentially saying, hey, this is not sustainable. That's right. right. The, this is too too quick. You're going to run out of energy um, supplies here, which is going to threaten your survival. That's exactly it. But if you set it up the right way, then you can pretty much go for like a few months, depending on body fat level, without having any cravings. Mm -hmm. Now, when they come up, how do we how do we look at that, and how do we approach mm -hmm. it if it's not the calorie deficit? So a few things here: if the macros are in line, I can micronutrients too. So again. If the protein is on point, the carbs and the fats, and they're still expecting, they're still experiencing cravings and hunger, then sometimes we have to look at the boring stuff like sleep, mm -hmm. stress levels, which I know this is always like big words in the health space, but really like sleep is your best nutrition. I would like to say that sleep is mm -hmm. the best nutrition. There's also research out there right. comparing people who slept five mm -hmm. hours to people who slept eight mm -hmm. hours, people who slept five hours right. had higher risk for weight gain, right. certain diseases mm -hmm. and, and all of that stuff. And interestingly, that sleep deprivation seems to not only increase your caloric intake the next day in most people because it affects cravings and, and hunger um, signals, but also seems to, to create this scenario where you are preferentially storing visceral fat. So mm. the fat around the organs, which is the, the kind of more dangerous fat, um, so that's interesting. That's super interesting. So you want to make sure that all of these bases are lined up first because before you go to the tactics. So making sure you sleep seven to nine hours. And again, like I know some people, sometimes life gets busy and you can't sleep that much. So I totally understand that. Try to get it as high as possible and make sure nutrition is in line. Um, and then some tactics can be, firstly, try to add more volume to your meals. So volume obviously is going to fill up your stomach and make you feel fuller and more satisfied. So the easiest way to do that without adding too much extra calories, which you maybe want to keep in check, is by adding more vegetables, right? Adding more broccoli, more spinach, um, more kale, low calorie, mm -hmm. but high volume foods, which give you a lot of bang for your buck. Right. Mushrooms. Um, mushro mushrooms are amazing, actually. That's mm -hmm. a good point. And just packing a lot of those mm -hmm. in, your, in your meals. And actually interesting, just a quick tactic as well. What I like to do when I start my journey to to a six pack, when I have a shoot coming up or for summer, I like to not eat as much volume initially, because I'm already I'm just starting my diet and I'm still fresh and I'm excited and motivated and my body can get rid of a lot of fat. And then as I get closer to this leanness level where hunger is going to be more prevalent, I start increasing my fiber. So mm -hmm. when I have my fiber and my veggie intake too high from the beginning, I'm kind of used to that. So then it doesn't have the same effect if I increase it later on on, on mm. my journey. So interesting. That's that's yeah. one of the tactics you can definitely Do you like bake cauliflower? Yes. Ever do that? I that's love a good that. One too. That's yeah. a great one. Just put a few spices and cayenne pepper, paprika, garlic, onion powder, all that sort of stuff. Bake the cauliflower. Delicious. It's delicious. Actually I was surprised. I think also I think it's a one restaurant called Woods here in Bali mm -hmm. where it's like cauliflower. Um, I think it's steak or like just a, like one cauliflower. Yeah, I was like, let's see how satisfying this is. Actually, really satisfying mm -hmm. and really tasty as well. So um, you can definitely work with veggies to increase your volume. Um, you can definitely also have some. So when it comes to losing fat, you definitely want to have whole foods and want to make sure you don't have too much processed food. But sometimes it's helpful to have some sweets in your diet as well and not be too afraid of them. So maybe having Nora cookie here, maybe having a high protein vegan dessert recipe that you use so you can lower those cravings too. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have sugar and salt and oil right. for your whole journey, at some point your body's going to start craving it. And then you maybe have this binging attack and one day mm -hmm. where you eat all of, these, all of this junk food because you didn't have any mm -hmm. sugar for like two months straight. So I like to have, I like to give our clients an option as well and for myself to, to have a little bit of sweets and treats here and there that mm -hmm. fits into the framework. So they can just feel like, hey, it's a lifestyle mm -hmm. and I'm not completely right. restricting myself. So sort of moderating the intake rather than exclusion. 
or complete restriction. What would you say to someone that says, okay, but if I have that, those REOs, they're in the cupboard. It's a good point. Yes, it's a good point. That's that's actually for me. What works is not having it at home. So I can see the argument where, hey, I'm buying this package to have one a day. It can be, yeah, it can be a trap. But also, I think kind of when you show yourself, hey, I can have these foods and you can have them in your cupboard, then it really becomes the lifestyle at that point. Because mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are still in this, in this diet on and diet off mindset where, okay, for the next three months, I'm committed, I'm getting lean for summer, which, which is great. But then afterwards, they're going back to normal and then it's just this endless cycle. But mm-hmm. if you can have these foods around you mm-hmm. all the time and you can kind of make it work, then you're like, wow, like I can eat whatever I like to and still be healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the that's the end goal that we all want right there. Yes. Yeah. That's what the what people should strive for, in my opinion, um, because what you can sustain is what can create results. Mm-hmm. And I think if you restrict yourself on all aspects, it's hard to sustain and then it's hard to keep the results. So maybe mm-hmm. think about what could you be doing for the rest of your life? And mm-hmm. I think... I just think that vegan keto might not be might not be in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That the adherence on that could be a little difficult. Um the the adherence on the standard keto diet's not great. So um maybe we'll see a study look at vegan keto one day. Um let's talk about preparing food and or just meals in general. So let's start with at home. Um are you a fan of of using sort of quote unquote meal prep um, and and sort of um, really planning out the week of, of meals and batch cooking and, and that sort of um, thing or how do you sort of encourage people to to go about the creation of the food that they're eating? Yes, I have a simple approach that I like to share here which is very applicable and I think a lot of people don't have that much time to spend in their kitchen and don't want to maybe spend four hours on the weekend prepping their food, um, which is still a great bang for your buck. If you think about it, then you're set for the whole week. But if you're like, hey, I just want to spend 30 minutes a day in the kitchen max and I want to have my lunch and dinner and just be on on track with my with my goals. I like the double dinner prep, which I think I coined. Maybe there's someone else doing it, but um, I discovered it for myself. And what basically is, I was just at some point, I was like, I'm just too lazy. Like I don't want to cook twice a day, right? So I was like, how can I hack just being in the kitchen for like 20, 30 minutes a day, but still having my lunch and dinner ready? So like the name says, when you cook dinner, just cook double the amount, twice the amount, double the amount of carbs, proteins, whatever is in there. And then you can use the other half for lunch the next day. And then you do the same thing next day as well for dinner. And then the only thing you have to prep in addition is breakfast. And usually either I skip breakfast, I do a minute fasting, or it's just a quick oatmeal that I can do in five minutes or some or a smoothie or a shake, right. which makes it simple. So if you really think about it, it's 30 minutes mm-hmm. of doing that. And it's worked great for me, it's worked great for clients. And I think it's very practical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I agree. Yeah, I would. My breakfasts are usually quite quick and easy. One thing I would probably do as much as I can is soak the oats overnight, but then they're ready to go in the morning and you just add whatever you're adding to them and that takes a couple of minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So it really doesn't take that much time. Uh, I think a lot of time it's it's a commitment question and asking yourself, hey, do I really want this? Mm-hmm. And then finding a solution to, right. to make it happen. Yeah, because you can you you can procrastinate and kind of come up with every excuse for why you can't do this, right? Your brain is is sort of trying to to go down all of those different paths, probably because um, you know there's some, I guess, fear or uh, a degree of anxiety associated with you know committing to something and sticking to it, yes. and, and being accountable to yourself for those results. It's really interesting. What I like to say or ask people who are struggling with meal prep: you have to eat anyway. Right, so you might as well eat the right things. I mean, mm-hmm. if it's like twenty minutes going to the to the bakery, or thirty minutes to the restaurant, like might as well use this time to prep your own food. Like, mm-hmm. might as well the things you're already doing right now. You don't want to like necessarily completely switch your life around. You want to try and find a way to just kind of slide in these new habits, mm-hmm. 
so it's like it's really efficient and you don't have to do all this extra work mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things that could be applied to not just nutrition right, right. Um, maybe when going to work maybe you get off the station mm -hmm. like one station earlier and you walk to rest right it's trying to find sneaky ways to get healthy habits into your day I think uh, mm -hmm. makes a big difference too I'm looking at that book over there on the shelf I think you mentioned it earlier yes that's a, a James Clear's Atomic Habits is um, certainly one to read if you're interested in habit formation. Yeah, um, one of my favorite books. What, so what about if someone's going out for dinner? So they're, they're, they're sort of on the program, so to speak, and they're thinking about their energy consumption, they have goals in the gym, they're on a program, really excited to feel healthier, to feel stronger, um, but perhaps the, their social life often sort of gets the better of them. And um, do you, so this is someone who um, is going out for dinner a few times a week, let's say um, they're, they're trying to do everything they can sort of right um, at home. Then they find themselves out at, at the restaurants and um, maybe things don't always go to plan. Do you have any tips for helping them navigate that space? Yes, I have. And it's, it's a common thing. And I want to say that I'm not a big fan of necessarily restricting yourself in all aspects of your lifestyle where it consumes like meal prep and training consumes all of your life. You want to enjoy your life as well, right? It needs mm -hmm. to be something that uh, feels like a lifestyle change. I think I've brought my meal prep maybe just a handful of times somewhere. Um, so I really like to also like just enjoy myself there. But just to answer the question, I would firstly challenge that person. Sometimes people say, hey, it's my environment. Hey, it's my, my family. I have all these business dinners and I would ask I would tell them or like, it's like hey my partner is bringing all this food home and I would ask them but it's not your partner who's putting the food in your mouth right so just to stir the pot a little bit and then make them realize hey like I need to take ownership of the situation because they're still eating it they're still picking it up and if you realize that that's the first step I think that's the mindset part hey I'm in charge I have ownership and then the solution could be different folds. It could be not even going to the dinner, right? That's mm -hmm. one part where I think, even though I just said it's a lifestyle change, sometimes life comes in seasons. So maybe you want to think about, hey, for the next three months, I'm just fully on. I will tell everybody, my family, my friends, that I'm committed to this and I just want to get all I can off this journey and really finally understand how it works. And then later on, you can still eat out, right? It's not like this has to go on forever. You can still... Yeah, change your lifestyle around afterwards, right? That's the one path you can take, which I think is valuable. But when it comes to the tactical part to how do I navigate really eating out, there's a few things I do. Firstly, if you know you're going to eat out, I would say try to save up your calories and not eat that much food leading up to that dinner or that event because just by nature, that will help you stay within your um, calorie budget for the day. So I like to do that. So intermittent fasting is a great option here and just making sure you get your protein set before you go to that event so that's what I personally do um, I like that then another option could be um, when you are at the event just maybe looking beforehand looking at the menu and seeing what could be options and just asking the waiter hey can I have these veggies just steamed Not, I don't want to have oil on them or can, can you maybe add more tofu here? Can you maybe add more seitan here? So mm -hmm. the basic framework could be look out for a protein source. So when you're eating out, mm -hmm. try to get a protein source, which could be tofu, tempeh, seitan, um, or something with protein powder. Mm -hmm. They have that. TVP. TVP, also a great choice. Um, so that's definitely what you want to have. Why protein? And we talked about it, why it's important. Mm -hmm. um, but you definitely need to be satisfied to get proper nutrients. And then you want to have veggies which will add volume to your meal which will make you again satisfied and just give you a lot of extra micronutrients too and then you want to be the rest sometimes it's hard because some restaurants have rice some have potatoes some have pasta pasta all of that stuff that's not too bad i think carbs are actually pretty fine when it comes to those eating out events i think the biggest downfall could be the fat sources so the dressings right if something is deep fried for example mm -hmm. Um, if there's a lot of peanut butter or tahini, um, those things usually have a lot of calorie density or desserts as well. Um, I think, mm -hmm. I still remember it was, was a few years ago, one of my favorite 
fitness influencers posted like a really small piece of cake like in the stories. Mm -hmm. He was like, what do, you, what do you guys think? How many calories is in there? And I, I tapped like, I don't know, like 500. And it ended up being like 1400 calories in like literally like in this small piece of, of cake, yeah. which is, is interesting, but they can pack so much sugar and oil and all of that, just a small piece of, of dessert. Mm -hmm. So when you go out, look for your protein, look for your veggies, have a carb mm -hmm. source and try to be mindful of mm -hmm. the, the dressings and the fat sources. Mm -hmm. Do you ask for those on the side? That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. you could definitely do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe asking for extra extra portion of protein is helpful. I also found that sometimes the vegan restaurants might not be a smart choice when you're trying to lose weight and, and gain muscle because there's going to be vegan burgers, mm -hmm. vegan pizza, all these things you want to try, which you definitely can, but maybe it's smarter to go to the Italian place where you can have pasta rabbiata, right? Which is maybe 600, 700 calories when it comes to it. Or um, an Asian place. I love Asian places mm -hmm. for, for eating out because they always have tofu, mm -hmm. mostly. Um, they have rice-based meals, a lot of veggies. So like trying to also affect your choices will definitely help mm -hmm. you as well when it comes to staying on track. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I found helps. So vegan restaurants overrated. <laughs> <laughs> You're stirring the pot here, but <laughs> some definitely are. Yeah, when it yeah. comes to when it comes to health, I think mm -hmm. some of these health cafes as well. Um, they're like posting on their menu high protein mm -hmm. bowl, and then the ingredients are quinoa, falafel, right, and mm. so some is and so, it's like twenty grams of protein. So funny story, <laughs> I have a restaurant in, in Bondi. You probably know that, you um, do, yeah. Eden. And a bit of inside info, the healthiest items on the menu are ordered the least. Oh, my God. So, um, you know, I had great ambitions at the beginning to make the entire menu as healthy as, as possible. Um, of course, nice and high in protein, but just, just you know, health-focused meals. Um, but the consumers kind of told us otherwise so um, it's not to say wow. there's not healthy things on the menu there are but um you know some of those foods that you just sort of mentioned like the burgers um and chips they tend to be the most popular items but That's i guess it's because so it's people that you know something maybe perhaps that they're less likely or able to make at home that's really interesting yeah i think i always love when like my favorite Restaurants are restaurants who put macros on the on the meals, mm -hmm. um, but that's just us, right? I mean, we are obsessed about this stuff and we love it. But it's really interesting to know that. But I think, yeah, I found that definitely like healthy cafes and restaurants. I mean, what are they optimizing for? They're optimizing for taste most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what's going to have people come mm -hmm. back. And a lot of people are not protein conscious right. or or really like macro mm -hmm. conscious, so it makes sense mm -hmm. to optimize for taste. Yeah, I always, not that I count my calories, but I'm always conscious that when I'm eating out, if I was to look at a plate and try and guess the calories, I sort of assume that whatever my guess is, is under what's actually in there. Because as you say, you know, salt, oil, sugar, I think chefs call it SOS. That's their secret ingredients. And that just gets <laughs> sprinkled into everything, into those um, sauces, as you say. And, um, you know, frankly, that's why eating out um, tastes so great and often tastes different to our food at home. Absolutely, yes. So if you're trying to lose fat, gain muscle and be a healthy person on a plant-based diet, you can definitely eat out and you can definitely fit into your lifestyle. Um, my favorite restaurants to do, to, to go for are again, Italian places, Asian places. Mm -hmm. um, and if you find like a, vegan fitness place that has tempeh tofu and all of that stuff choices that are not that great are most like mediterranean food like hum mm -hmm. the like the falafel falafel hummus it's really really high fat really tough to make work um also again like vegan places we have mm, burgers and pizza You're just going to be tempted to have um mm -hmm. these things um those are what i would say also indian food can be tough as well um, right, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, the rice that's fine, but also a lot of the sauces are high in fat and not so high, not so high in protein. So that's why I would group it out if you look at restaurant choices and mm -hmm. 
um, right now, for example. So just to give some people some some hope um, and some vision, you might be listening to this and like, hey, do I need to prep my meals mm. every day for the rest of my life and track my macros? No, you don't need to do that. It's just helpful to do in the beginning, tracking your macros. We, we talked about this, mm -hmm. but also realizing that life comes in seasons. So maybe it's the season where you don't eat out that much. But then in the future, I'm currently eating out twice a day. I'm not having breakfast and I'm having lunch I'm eating out and food that I'm eating out too. And I'm still able to achieve my health and fitness mm -hmm. goals uh, without having to prep or track or count every single macro. So that's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good addition to kind of put things into perspective. Um, what, what would you say to someone or how would you help someone sort of course correct if they <laughs> have done well all week, um, things don't go to plan on the weekend? Um, the advice you're giving about the restaurants just didn't pan out, mate. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've all been there. And, and so they're feeling a little bit deflated on Sunday evening, Monday morning. You know, it was last week, the meal prep and all the exercise, was it wasted? What have they done and how do they kind of reconcile this and, and get back on the horse? Very good question. And I think well, how I like to think about it is at this, in this moment, you can use the extra carbs and the extra food you consume as fuel for your new week and for your workouts. So obviously, if you have more carbs in your system, you're going to be strong on your workouts. You're going to have bigger, better power output. Um, your pump is going to be better. So actually working out after that type of weekend is kind of fun. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, if people know that, then they might be more motivated mm, to... You, you wear your hat <laughs> on Mondays and Tuesdays. <laughs> exactly. My hat days are my workout <laughs> days to remind me. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's a good point. Um, having rituals as well is very helpful, I think. But totally, I mean, use the extra food you consume and... and put it in, in your workouts and just realize it will happen and it's totally okay. It's 100% okay. And I think getting back on it is the growth that you want. I think a lot of people look down on being off track and having like a few days off, whatever it might be, but then they don't see the opportunity of mental growth and growth of discipline and just like strengthening yourself, like the resilience you have by getting back on track, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing this as a growth, a growth opportunity um, because a lot of people will not get back on track. They will just keep on sliding and mm -hmm. slide off off track. And if you use it to fuel your, mm -hmm. your growth, I think it's, it's powerful. Right. Show, show yourself that you can, you can course correct. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what we use when we look at the, like the Christmas and Thanksgiving and holidays coming up. Internally, we like to challenge our people, our clients, and tell them that this is the moment where you can show yourself if you really want this. When everyone is telling you, hey, you're okay, you don't need to be on track, or hey, you don't need to eat healthy, and it's okay, that's the moment where you can say, no, like I'm committed to this, and you're showing yourself, hey, I'm taking on this new identity, and I'm going for this. Doesn't need, doesn't need, doesn't mean you have to be perfect mm -hmm. while being at the Christmas table, but just going through this test and coming out strong at the end um, is really going to help you power through when it's when it's over. You're mm -hmm. like, hey, I went through this. Now it's easy. Now mm -hmm. it's easy mode. And right. it's going to be helpful. And fun fact, I think there's also research showing that people who weigh themselves to a Christmas period versus people who do, doesn't, do not weigh themselves to Christmas, the people who weigh themselves, they actually lost weight during the mm -hmm. Christmas period. So... Maybe also just as a side fact, this might be might be interesting to do. Mm -hmm. Put on your hat every day and wear yourself every mm -hmm. day, and then I wonder if they were as happy. That would be another interesting thing to look at. Yeah, that's a good point. So it might come back to the individual. Yeah, but I think you know, um, in the in the weight loss kind of research, certainly daily weighing seems to be beneficial. I know there's a fair bit of controversy about it. And it's not the only kind of metric of success um do you have your clients sort of doing some sort of weighing protocol like a daily daily weigh-in in the same conditions and then taking a weekly average or if not weight what what uh what are you kind of focusing on in terms of their changes in body comp yes so we do that we highly recommend 
them weighing themselves every day so we can take the average for the week and compare the weekly averages, which is also an important takeaway. Um, if you compare just one way in a week, mm-hmm. you're right. gonna go crazy. Yeah, yeah. If you compare Thursday to Friday, yeah, mm-hmm. it's gonna it can be it jumps so much. I've seen a lot mm-hmm. the past few years, and that's very important. But there's also what we like to call basically results KPIs. So KPIs comes from the marketing world, means key performance indicators. So if you want to basically analyze, okay, how am I doing? How's my journey going? You can look at weight, which is one, and like you said, it's not. It doesn't determine everything. Like mm-hmm. it can be just one metric you look at. The second metric you like to look at is measurements, specifically around your around your waist, waist measurements and hip measurements, which we talked about before. This real fat. Mm-hmm. This is the fat you definitely want to get rid of. And also, for most people, it's important to have a lean stomach and to get mm-hmm. rid of of uh, belly fat. And maybe some one week you didn't lose any weight, but maybe your waist measurement went down. Mm-hmm. So how can you interpret that? Probably right. you gained muscle mm-hmm. while you lost fat, which is what you want. That's mm-hmm. like the, the best thing you can have. And then maybe the third KPI could be looking in the mirror. So just looking at yourself and seeing what changed on my body composition. Mm-hmm. Again, sometimes the weight stays the same, but you look leaner and you have more muscle. You're like, that's fine with me because what does the weight mean mm-hmm. anyway? Like for me, for example, I don't care if I weigh 210 or 215 pounds, like... What does it mean to me? Mm-hmm. I just like to see the mirror that I'm lean, I'm strong. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people put too much emphasis on weight, but I also think some people don't look at it and then they don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Maybe just as a bonus, the fourth KPI we like to uh, introduce as well is people telling you, people giving you feedback. Maybe family members who haven't seen you in six months or friends who haven't seen you in a few months. You're like, you look leaner, like you look like you changed. And that's a great way of measuring your progress too because we are very critical of ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. And when someone else tells us, then we finally get this objective Mm -hmm. feedback that we we need sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And I guess as well, how you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone's losing a lot of weight and um, they have, you know, chronic disease or or on the verge of... um, you know, losing a significant amount of, of body fat is going to leave people feeling just better generally in their body and in their sort of day-to-day. Yes, that's crucial. So that's always important to to feel, feel aligned with your health as well. Mm-hmm. I mentioned overrated, underrated before and it was a bit of a, a kind of inside joke, I guess. So folks that follow you will know that's a segment. Would you call it a segment? Yeah, it's a segment. <laughs> it's a I like segment. to I like to do in it's my. It's a segment in the uh, Fritz <laughs> show. Um, I enjoy it. I think I featured in there a couple of times. Um, I think it was good. Um, yeah, it's if always it's funny. Been bad, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> so, um, explain to people what this segment is: uh, overrated, underrated, and then maybe we'll go through some of the top ones, and that can be the way that we round out this conversation. Nice. Yeah, I think it's a fun way to talk about these topics. So basically how it works is um, my community asked me about a certain nutrition training or in general thing and asked me if I I feel like it's overrated or it's underrated. And I think it's it's really fun to do that and it helps Mm -hmm. give some context. And a lot of people... It's interesting. Some people were asking, "Hey, what about what do you think about this vegan doctor, or what do you think about Simon Hill?" <laughs> and um, that's always fun as mm-hmm. well. Okay, well, I won't ask you that, man. Um, <laughs> I'll wait for the next time that gets asked. Um, but let's go through a few of these, and I'll, I might kick it off. Protein bars, overrated, underrated. So the thing with this <laughs> with the segment is that it's obviously very like black and white, mm-hmm. right? I want and I want the, the black and white <laughs> answer. Very good. Because this is a science based show, so we're going black and white now. <laughs> right. Um, against the grain. So Okay, no. Do the black and white thing and yeah. then we can go into the nuance. Okay, so protein bars are overrated. Most vegan protein bars are overrated because they're not actually a protein bar. If you look at most of the bars that are out there, you look at the back and it's like 200, 250 calories and then ten grams of protein. And mm-hmm. yes, it's some protein, but it's at that point it really can be considered like a chocolate bar with all the macros that are mm-hmm. are present there. So yeah, Mars bar in disguise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it really is the case. Um, 
So in, in that case, you may as well just buy the Mars bar. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Might be even tastier. So in that case, it's overrated. I would say 95% of vegan protein bars are overrated. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the more nuanced answer mm-hmm. is that there can be good protein bars and they mm-hmm. can be good for you okay. if you're on the rush, right. on the go, and you want to have a quick protein source. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as they have the 1 to 10 ratio um, when it comes to protein versus calories. So for example, if a protein bar is 20 grams protein, I would like it to have like max 200 calories. Mm-hmm. Um to make it a good protein source. So every gram of protein, there's 10 calories or less. Yes. Right. Okay, that's a simple rule. And if you look at seitan, for example, just as a protein source example, some seitan packs 20 grams of protein for 100 calories. Mm -hmm. So that's an even better ratio. Mm -hmm. One to five. Yeah. And that way, and that's how I look at protein Mm -hmm. sources when when I see it in the store or... In general, and that one to ten rule is going to wipe out ninety five percent of protein bars. Yes, just naturally. Um, I had to <laughs> laugh. I was in um, Uluwatu, and went into a store, and I was buying plant based milk of some sort there, and I saw um, this packet. I think I might have told you this story, and it said protein bar, or protein bars, or protein balls. Some some people will be familiar with this, and I can't remember the brand. And it's not about the brand, but I um, I thought, okay, I'm going to turn this around and just look at what are the macronutrients in this product. And mind you, protein was the biggest word on the front of this pack, huge. It had 250 calories, and it had two grams of protein. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's so, insane. Um, it's a buzzword for sure. Yeah. And it sells like if that had a said carb balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what it, but really it's a carb ball. It's not yeah. a protein ball. Um, it's so funny. How many, how many units are selling if all of these products <laughs> had to call them by the macronutrient that provides the most calories in that product? Yeah. They'd all be called fat bars or carb bars. <laughs> fat bars, yeah. Um, oh my god that's good anyway so I guess moral of the story just turn the the protein bars around have a look that 1 to 10 ratio is a, is a good option and you know sometimes if it's within the your sort of calorie budget and you're wanting to have something tasty you might be better off with something that's not a protein bar yeah if, if it's between a kind of low protein bar and something else anyway it's sad but it's it's the truth yeah Okay, so that's that's protein bars. What else is um, overrated? What else is overrated? Um, I think BCAAs are overrated, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Um, so branched chain amino acids is uh, like a supplement that you can buy. And some people argue that, especially eating a plant-based diet, you need more. You need to supplement BCAAs because you're missing um, those three mm-hmm. amino acids. Mm-hmm. And you want to trigger muscle protein synthesis with them, um, which again, just for context for listener, if you want to build muscle, you want to trigger muscle protein synthesis and there's like a leucine threshold of, I think it's three grams. And if you go, if you hit that, then you activate muscle protein synthesis. Now, what's important though, is that you can't just have this isolated or just three mm-hmm. B, like amino acids, which the BCAAs are, you need all of them, right? And... A lot of vegans think if I supplement BCAAs, then I will mm. trigger this muscle growth. But you need all the essential amino acids. So you're better off supplementing protein powder, mm-hmm. which comes with all of the essential amino acids. Or even EAAs sometimes might be an option too. Mm-hmm. But BCAAs are definitely overrated as mm-hmm. well. Okay. Beans, we've already kind of done to death. Overrated. <laughs> yeah, I think we... I think we yeah, we've we, talked about it. We talked about that. Um, what about underrated? What are the, some of the common, I guess, things that people throw out um, at you on social when you put up this segment, things that you would say are underrated? Um, there's different things, right? So I think sometimes it's very specific, they ask very specific questions like eggplants and broccoli mm-hmm. and like all of these things for me are um, underrated, obviously, because um, mm-hmm. they're, they're very healthy for you. You can 
cannot have enough of them, right? Um, I'm thinking of very a very juicy one on top of my head. Um, what else could be could be underrated? What are your thoughts? Maybe um, I think. Well, I'd say um, underrated creatine. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. We we spoke about that. Creatine underrated, and also there's a lot of exercise things we could cover, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe we look at nutrition. I think we've covered a lot of good aspects. Um, some things like more controversial ones, like apple cider vinegar, mm-hmm. for example, um, is overrated in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people try to make it like this fat loss tool that will help mm-hmm. you burn fat just by drinking it, which I don't think is the case. Mm-hmm. Um, also, some diets, some vegan diet alternatives, I get asked sometimes. So, eighty ten ten diet, right? So. 80% carbs, 10% fat, 10% protein. I think it's also overrated for for help for fat loss and muscle gain results. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really thinking of an underrated one. I'm okay, actually, what about what about a raw vegan diet? Raw vegan diet, yeah, it's overrated. Mm-hmm. Overrated for a few key reasons. I think maybe when you think about raw vegan diet, a lot of people think because you eat the foods and it's rawest form like that's the best you can do for your body but they don't realize that mm-hmm. some nutrients even they only get yeah you only get them when you cook the food actually right so there's definitely value in cooking food and on the other side like you're li- really limiting your diet you're not going to be able to get enough protein you're going to have digestive problems and you're not going to get enough nutrients mm-hmm. as well so definitely overrated mm-hmm. and I've, it's not sustainable i've got a couple underrated okay you mind you might have different views on these, so okay. that'll be interesting. That's it. Um, that's always fun. I would say fermented foods are underrated. Mm-hmm. Do you eat fermented foods like kombucha or sauerkraut or kimchi? Here in Bali, I've been eating more kimchi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would say I need to do more, look look into it more mm-hmm. to give like a more okay. in-depth answer. But I think, I don't think they're overrated. I think there's a point in right. having them. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send you a couple of episodes good. on uh, fermented foods. That'd we be need, good. We need to uh, pump those numbers up in your diet. Okay, I have um, I have a different one. So, sprouting, mm-hmm. sprouting food, mm-hmm. overrated or underrated? Mm. If you can adhere to it, and you have the time and the patience, and that you can get it into your routine, I'm going to say underrated based on the fact. So I've set those caveats. I think many people fall off the bandwagon. They get excited and don't realize that you've got to rinse them twice a day and um, and whatnot. But if you can get around that and create a sustainable habit um, with sprouting, I think that they're very, very cheap and cost effective. So from that point of view, I would say underrated. Nice. That's good. I like it. So it's always you always can put it into context. I think... What happens sometimes in the plant-based community with people really trying to make a positive change in their health, they might get too into the weeds with all of these things. I need to sprout my lentils, I need to um, soak mm-hmm. my nuts, I need to do all these things. And I think under that aspect, I think it might be something to add to your lifestyle later mm-hmm. once you got the basics done, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Um, because the basics are going to give you the biggest returns. And then if you want to have more returns and even better lifestyle then you can add these additional mm-hmm. things that's just how i think no about i think it. it's i think that's a, a really important point i mean trying to change too much at once doesn't lead to a whole lot of success for most people so yeah. getting the foundations and focusing on the big things first the big rocks makes a lot of sense so whether it's underrated or overrated may depend on where you're at with your yes. journey i mean i just started adding sauna and ice plunge to my routine i've been exercising for five years plus mm-hmm. So sometimes like really getting the basics down and squeezing all you can out of that and then you can always add on things to get even more out of it. I have one more underrated thing which I think is funny or is, is a good point. Um, carbs are underrated. Carbs in the evening are underrated, mm-hmm. I would say. I think there's still a notion out there in the general fitness space that carbs in the evening are bad for you and they will make you gain weight and you should avoid them before dinner, before 7 p.m. Like, why would you have carbs after 7 p.m.? Right. Well, at 7 p.m., there's a, a magic button, a switch, and all of a sudden now those carbs go straight to fat storage. 
you do. But if you buy my program, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, so actually, I think, I mean, you can probably um, say it more eloquently, but there's research that shows that if you have carbs in the evening, it might actually make you fall asleep mm -hmm. much easier and you have better sleep, I think. So overall, uh, just to answer the question or the, the topic, um, if you have carbs in the evening or in the morning, it doesn't really matter. What matters is your daily nutritional intake, like mm -hmm. your calorie intake and macro intake. And if that's optimized for um, the results you want, then you mm -hmm. can have carbs right. whenever you like. Yeah. Maybe not too close to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like to go to bed with a full stomach. I think that definitely also affects sleep mm -hmm. quality. Um, but overall, mm -hmm. nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, the only caveat that I would, uh, I would add there is there is some research to suggest if someone has, say, poor glycemic control, like they have type 2 diabetes, that they may benefit from having more of their calories earlier in the day. And the interesting thing is that this does seem to be tied to, to our circadian rhythms. So at nighttime, as the light's going down, or as it should unless we're sitting in a bright room, um, melatonin is going up and cortisol is coming down. And coinciding with that is a reduction in your insulin sensitivity. So your ability to actually get glucose where it needs to, to go. Um, so if someone already has poor glycemic control, then eating a lot of food in general and particularly high carb food late in the day may, may result in poorer blood glucose control. Um, but that's going to be someone with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. For them, they might benefit by having more of their food earlier in the day when melatonin is low and cortisol is high and they're very insulin sensitive. Um, but otherwise, yeah, good tip. Don't be scared of carbs. Don't be scared of carbs. Um, and on carbs, I'd say something else that's underrated that's just come to mind. And this actually works with your, was it double dinner prep? Yes. Right. Um, you know when you cook potatoes and you let them cool? Have you heard this before? I've heard of it. Right. Yeah. So you increase the amount of resistant starch. So mm -hmm. now those potatoes that you have the next day for your lunch um, actually contain a whole lot more of resistant starch, which is a prebiotic. Um, so prebiotic meaning it feeds the good gut bugs, which then produce compounds that reward you. And um, so certain types of fiber are prebiotic resistant starches, prebiotic and polyphenols. Polyphenols are responsible for a lot of the color in the, the plant foods that we eat. But the three of those sort of fall underneath that prebiotic umbrella heading. Um, all of them, including the resistant starch, feeding the good gut bugs. So um, white potatoes that you have for leftovers, um, underrated. Let's go. I like it. What do you think about the omega-6, omega-3 ratio? Do you think it's overrated? Overrated. Yeah. I've gone through a lot of that literature. I don't buy into the sort of fear around omega-6s. I think if you're getting your omega-6s from ultra-processed packaged food, um, you know, that's not a food matrix that is going to be doing you any favors for your health, but it's not just the, the, the presence of omega-6s in there. There's a whole lot of things, a lot of the fiber stripped out, the protein stripped out, water stripped out, a lot of micronutrients are stripped out. There's added sugars, there's added fats. Um, so it's hard to sort of look at the consumption of those foods, the poor health outcomes and say, that's seed oils, um, that's omega-6s. I feel like that's a big leap to make. Um, where so I don't think the omega six to three ratio is that is that helpful, and I don't think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it is. Um, I think where where there was potentially some evidence earlier on around that ratio, I think it comes down to a lack of omega threes in the diet. So I don't, I'm not I don't think it's so much this kind of six to three ratio. I think it's just if you have ins, insufficient omega threes in the diet, um, which can happen if you're eating a low quality diet, then you might run into um, some problems. I did an episode with Bill Harris, um, Professor Bill Harris on omega-3. So um, anyone that wants to do a big deep dive into the science on that, that's that one's in the archives. That's amazing. Yeah, I think omega-3 is like such a powerful um, thing to look at and has so many benefits mm -hmm. when you supplement it. Yeah. Right. And, you know, these sort of polyunsaturated fats, omegas, threes, and sixes, 
it is quite clear in the literature that when you when you reduce saturated fat in the diet, what you replace that with really matters. You know, so you'll see people point to a study that you know showed that saturated fat reducing it didn't didn't reduce heart disease. But then if you dig into it, you say, okay, well the people that were not eating as much saturated fat, what were they eating instead? And <clears throat> usually, almost always, it's refined carbohydrates. And we know that swapping saturated fat for refined carbs is a lateral move, or maybe even you could be worse off. But very, very consistently, you see when you swap saturated fat for polyunsaturated fats, omega-3s or 6s, you see a reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. So um, there's a lot of rhetoric about saturated fat and the, the kind of take-home message that I repeat over and over is that what you replace it with really matters. And from a plant-based perspective, that means um, avoiding or you know, reducing the, the exposure to tropical oils like coconut oil and palm oil, which are very high in saturated fats. Um, they're really the only two sort of plant sources, coconut products and palm oil products that are maybe going to push you into an unhealthy saturated fat intake if you're having a lot of them. That's one of the best things about a plant-based diet is naturally when you take out these animal foods, your saturated fat intake goes right down unless you um, consume a lot of those two foods. But um, less of those animal foods and tropical oils and more you know, nuts and seeds um, that are providing these polyunsaturated fats and, and even oils like um, flaxseed oil, for example. That's a, I love that. That's very helpful. So maybe <laughs> what do you think about coconut oil then? Overrated or underrated? Hugely overrated from a cardiovascular disease point of view and a, an inclusion in a plant-based dietary pattern, much better off using olive oil. Um, now, that said, you have a healthy dietary pattern and every now and then you, your friend of yours makes a vegan treat muffin or there's a, a little bit of coconut yogurt on your um, oats when you go and eat out. It's not going to be a problem. And um, particularly, so I... I often talk about measuring your LDL cholesterol or more specifically, and I don't want to go into the weeds too much, but more specifically ApoB, which is a, a better marker than LDL cholesterol. And my message to people is, and I sort of spoke about this before, that 80 milligrams per deciliter or lower is where you want to sit ideally. Now, some people can get there just through diet alone. Some people need diet and pharmaceutical medica medications to help them. It depends where they're, they're coming from, but a large majority of people can get there through diet alone. Um, and so to what extent can you include coconut oil or palm oil in your diet? Well, it's a, some of that's going to come down to your genetics. So what I say is test your levels and include it to the extent that it doesn't shift you up above that threshold. And then that way you can kind of, you know, titrate and work out well you know based on your genetics your body how much can you tolerate yes amazing so you would say having oil on a plant-based diet is, is fine it's, it's okay can we have oil i think the the claim that the plant-based diet has to be oil free is overrated um i don't think there's enough science there if you want to do an oil free diet i think fantastic and if someone loves that way of eating um let's say that it's really helping them lose weight because you know we discussed it before, oils can sort of increase the calorie density of our food and they can hide in our food when we eat out. Um, so from that perspective, I'm all for it. Um, I don't think we need to fear oils other than the fact that they contain a lot of calories per bite. Um, I don't think we need to fear them. And if within your dietary pattern and your sort of energy requirement and calorie budget, you can, you can include them, then I don't see that as a problem. Yes, I'm getting all the good good answers here. <laughs> <laughs> you flipped the interview here. Yeah. So um, back to you. Um, thank you for, for coming on and, and sharing. Really um, enjoy all of the, the constant content that you're putting out. I think it's highly practical. Um, it's very accessible. You have a, a real knack for, um, you know, understanding the, the type of information that really will help people um, and... And also, um, you have your finger on the pulse as to 
sometimes we can get a little bit into the weeds and we can forget, you know, what is it that people most need to know here? Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate your content from that perspective. It, it often reminds me of um, course correcting and, and coming back to some of the basics. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, Thanks so much. And I, uh, I hope that we can continue the conversation and um, do this again sometime. Thanks so much for having you on. Again, your show is really an inspiration for me and what really helps people like make these changes is understanding them on a science level and you and the guests you have definitely also put it in a put it out in a way that's very easily understandable and um, it's always up to date so really appreciate all your work and um, I'm very grateful that I could share some of my experience with you guys my pleasure thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science based conversation I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.